Well, thank you. Um, Ms. Warden, L, one of your presenters. Uh, yes, part of theatres too. Yeah, thanks. You're introducing those, Pam, are you? Uh, yes, I will do, Alan. I've got names, but they are buried somewhere. We are live, Alan. Right, good morning, everybody. This is the public board meeting for Northampton General Hospital for July. You're all very welcome. Um, I have apologies from Simon Weldon, Richard Apps, Andy Callow, Debbie Shanahan, Rachel Parker, and Denise Kirkham. Um, we have to welcome Hemant uh, Namad, who is his first meeting as interim medical director, following Matt Metcalf's moving to the post of ICB medical director and group chief medical advisor. We also welcome Dan Howard, digital director, deputizing for Andy Callow. We welcome Helen Ledbetter, Deputy Director of Nursing, deputising for Debbie Shanahan, and Ellie Southgate, freedom to speak up, Guardian to, represent, to present the annual report, and eventually Keith Brooks from Northampton's Health Charity CEO to present the charity's annual report. Do we have any other apologies or any declarations of interest? No, thank you very much. In which case, we shall go straight into the staff story. I'm going to hand over to Palmer, who's the Director of Ops for Northampton, and Palmer's going to introduce some colleagues from theatres and uh, take us through some of the things that have happened in theatres recently and the plans going forward for theatres. Palmer, over to you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so I was asked to bring some of our theatres team along today to talk about their journey, especially over the last two years, what's going on now and how we move forward. Uh, that leads into the wider point we're going to talk around later with theatre utilisation. So I think it's really important to get that personal aspect and just realise that actually there is a number we look at for utilisation, but actually the, the staff have a very difficult job and have had over the last few years. So I've got Joe Conway, who is one of our operation, uh, operating department practitioners, um, lesser spotted these days, um, and she's dying for theatres. We have Debbie Hill, who is one of our senior band sevens in theatres. I've got Katie, I can't see her on the squares. Um, she might not manage to dial in. Oh, there she is. She's just dialing in now. Uh, who is was the matron in theatres, just moved on, had her first day today in uh, education, I think it is. And Ruth Smith is part of the PMO. Uh, and they've just a big thank you to them. I know they're taking their time out of theatre to come and do this for half an hour and then jumping straight back into theatre itself. Um, so I've asked them really to talk about three part, three aspects. First aspect is the last two years in their journey, because it really is important to how things are going now. Then how are things now? You know, what does it look like? What does a good day look like? And also, what are we doing moving forward uh, from a people's perspective? So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jo. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so um, I've been asked to give you a very brief story about uh, um, my journey, our journey uh, during uh, COVID. Um, so during uh, COVID, our staff at Day Surgery were all redeployed to help provide a 24-hour service to ITU, HTU, COVID pods, uh, emergency theatres and the cardiac arrest teams. Between waves, our staff helped fill the staffing gaps due to start, uh, sickness and shielding to enable uh, elective theatres to reopen. Uh, in order... Um, in total, our unit was closed for 15 months and our staff were separated from one another um, while they were uh, absorbed into other teams across the trust. Um, we obviously did a very difficult job during COVID. Um, I, I can remember standing in the corridor of ITU and listening to my first handover brief and looking around at all my colleagues and everyone had this look of absolute horror. And... Um, I was trying to process in my mind how my skills as an ODP uh, was going to fit in with this care and, um, uh, you know, and what I could do uh, for the care of, of, of the patients on the other side of the doors. The donning and doffing stations uh, looked like something off of a movie uh, with gowns, gloves, goggles, um, jumpsuits and people having their wrists and ankles taped and, you know, really just thinking, how on earth could I help um, 
you know what's going on at the other side of those doors that my skills could be of any use to you know both in ITU and the COVID pods and you know not only that how were we going to wear this kit for 12 hours um, and you know and not having our own teams around us you know your trusted colleagues with you um, made that feel even worse. It, it really felt enormous. Um, as an ODP, I did do um, critical care transfers prior to COVID um, out of hours to um, other hospitals. So I felt like I had some skills that might be able to help, but you know, we, we weren't trained for this. We've, we've never done anything like this before. Um, and we felt really isolated as a team. It felt an enormous task and something that was really difficult to share with our family and friends because everyone really was so proud of us but that really isn't how we felt on a day-to-day -day basis um they didn't really ask but i think they could tell just how difficult it was with the facial injuries that we were going home with um and this this whole period of separation meant that you know many experienced members of staff felt disillusioned and decided to leave theatres for other opportunities and quite honestly an easier life um, this has directed. Um, this has directly impacted the skill mix and knowledge base that we have now within theatres, um, especially day surgery. We lost quite a few members of our team, and obviously that has an ongoing impact in um, training new people and and students. Um, our team were not always made to feel welcome in every environment they were redeployed in, especially when we told them that we were day surgery staff. You could see people really thinking, you know, how are these people going to help us in this critical care environment? Um, but honestly, every single person that I, I worked with um, from our team and others displayed real courage and professionalism um, in working in the unfamiliar environments and really were working well outside their scope of practice. Um, our unit has reopened now and we're trying to regain that team spirit, but staff shortages across the trust means that redeployment is still a daily um, occurrence and you know they the team are massively affected by the covid experience and their emotional resilience and morale is quite frankly really low and their ability to adapt to the the, the service needs um, is really starting to take a toll on their well-being but that being said our theater staff are extremely proud of the part that they played during covid in helping keep those emergency services working theaters running and doing the best possible thing that we could in the circumstances for our patients. Um, honestly, we don't give ourselves enough credit for the experience um, that we went through and the part that we played, but, and it's hard to quantify um, in a short statement, um, you know, the, the difference that we made um, and the patients and families that we helped, um, but we really did achieve incredible things and we are incredibly proud of ourselves. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. I'll hand over to Debbie. Um, thank you, Joe. Um, I think you have to sign off now, don't you? To yes, please go into a thank list. Thank you for listening, thank everybody. You. Thank you. So, as the manager of a disbanded team, my experience of COVID was very different to other Band Seven theatre managers. During the first wave, I spent the first six weeks of the pandemic with my team on critical care and theatre pods looking after COVID positive patients. Once the number of patients began to stabilise, senior management then decided to pull the band sevens from clinical duties and base them in main theatres where they could be a visible presence for staff. The idea was to offer junior members of the team a point of contact for emo emotional support uh, and for us to be able to monitor their well-being. Although I understood the rationale behind this, many theatre managers found this quite a difficult move as we felt our place was up with our colleagues on the front line looking after the COVID patients. As my day surgery unit was closed during the first six, of, uh, six months of COVID, I bounced between working in critical care, main theatres, gynae theatres and back and forth again between the three areas. When the second wave of COVID hit, theatre activity was halted again uh, and the band sevens were back in ITU and the theatre pods. We eventually reopened day surgery in June 2021, 15 months after it was closed. We were given three days to reclaim our theatre equipment, which had been distributed across the trust and restock and reopen the unit, making it safe for patients. 
a year after opening, we are still finding there are some bits of equipment missing and some essential pieces of equipment have had to be repurchased. The 15 months whilst our unit was closed was very challenging for me as a manager. It was difficult to keep the morale of the team up when my own morale was suffering also due to lack of a defined role, unclear direction, unclear expectations, and also a lack of a department and a team to manage. Having said all of that, I'm very proud of the team's resilience at the height of the pandemic and also during the second wave, which took much more of an emotional toll on everyone. The day surgery team accepted every challenge that was thrown their way and dealt with each situation with the utmost professionalism. We have been a team again now for just over a year, and although it has taken us some time to forge effective working relationships again, it has ultimately made us a much stronger team as each and every one of us have been there to support each other. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, I'll just invite Katie to come in now. Hello, apologies for the lack of camera because I don't have one. So I started as interim matron for theatres one year ago. So my COVID experience was very much on the front line as well. Um, I've now left theatres to undertake a new role in medical education, today being the first day. Um, but I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak with you today because I'm endlessly proud of the theatre teams for all they do for patients and for each other every day. And despite the challenges they've faced and continue to face. Against the backdrop of adversity and moral injury you've heard from Debbie and Joe, theatres have continued to provide life-saving surgery for patients and have implemented service improvements such as robotic assisted surgery and a review and expansion of the range of procedures we undertake in day surgery theatres um, amongst this time, which have absolutely been driven by the commitment and enthusiasm of the theatre teams themselves. As well as giving staff the opportunity to identify and lead on service improvement projects of their own, which they have engaged in willingly, we've promoted the voices of our theatre teams through monthly listening events, suggestion boxes and communication boards, and are promoting and engaging in levelling up opportunities for our internationally educated colleagues. One of the biggest challenges we continue to face is staffing, particularly anaesthetic practitioners, and this is a national issue made all the more challenging as we are unable to offer band six positions for ODPs and anaesthetic nurses that other trusts within the region and departments within our own hospital can offer. And despite this, we've made strong headway and have recently made conditional offers to four individuals, including our first international HCPC registrant. And we've implemented an ODP apprenticeship commencing in September. We funded and released some of our registered nurses to undertake the required post-registration anaesthetic training with Derby University that they need. And we've engaged with schools and colleges to promote perioperative careers and our trust. And our National ODP Day celebrations were published in the Operating Theatre Journal. As you know, the patient's perioperative journey doesn't begin and end at the theatre doors. So I'll hand you over to Ruth to talk about transformation around the wider perioperative pathway. Thank you, Katie. So to build on the really powerful stories that colleagues have kindly shared with us both on this call today and also through our discovery meetings, it's clear that the transformation programme must have a much wider scope than simply a percentage of utilisation rates. And we need to include the whole of the elective journey from being listed for a TCI for a patient right through to post-op recovery. And so to do that, we are going to be looking at reintroducing cohesive working across all of our teams to the 642 principles because they will deliver effective planning for activity, for staff, for equipment and for theatre space that make that on the day working that bit smoother for our teams and our patients. And we'll look at working on improving with data and reporting to ensure that our teams, our senior teams and, and, and our colleagues on the shop floor, so to speak, have the right information to be able to monitor and report on their activity. We'll look at configuring new digital platforms to support that. So, for example, Palantir and also solutions such as Isla Care, which offers an online patient questionnaire to support pre-op working. We'll work with all of our teams at each stage to understand and really learn more from their experiences over the past two years and ensure that we're doing with and not doing to, because that will result in processes that are owned and embedded by the teams and that will help that transfer into sustainable BAU working going forward. 
And the golden thread through everything that we're doing must be that we keep that focus on what makes a really good day in theatre for our patients and our staff. And that is our forefront of our focus to make sure the improvements that we introduce make things better for the people having surgery, the people delivering the surgery, the people arranging the surgery, and ultimately the whole experience. Thanks, Ruth. And just, just to finish off, I think Debbie just talk about what a good day looks like for you. Okay. So um, looking at we, where we are now, since reopening the department, the main challenges for us seem to have been around sickness, redeployment and theatre utilisation. Sickness, whether it be COVID or non-COVID related, continues to impact the lists across theatres. Not enough staff means lists have to be prioritised. The day surgery lists that are often the ones that are deemed non-urgent, so tend to be the ones that are cancelled. Staff are then redeployed across the other theatre areas and sometimes even to the wards. This has had a massive impact on staff's mental health and well-being and could be argued um, compounds the problem we are already having with sickness. Poor theatre utilisation is also a contributing factor to the everyday problems we face. Pre-COVID, day surgery was a busy high turnover unit. Since COVID, many of the staff involved in booking the lists have left, taking with them some of that institutional memory of what does and doesn't work well in day surgery. Every week at the 642 planning meeting, I try and highlight inappropriate procedures or patients added to the list. However, errors do keep happening, which often leads to cancellations on the day. I have been asked before, what makes a great day in theatre? Is it your favourite surgeon playing the same songs you like or is it someone bringing in nice coffees or cake? For most theatre staff, it's a lot more basic than that. It's about a well-planned list with well-selected patients, the right sets, equipment and consumables available. Everyone turning up for their shift, the the list starting and finishing on time and all patients discharged home safely. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. So thank you very much for your input, all of you. Um, I hope that shows the board. It was a very unvarnished, I didn't script it. I wanted to be as honest as possible about their experiences and what they're going through. And I hope that just shows that these, the hangover from COVID, even though we may have moved on from the larger waves, really does sit in there because they haven't had a chance to stop reset. They have been at it constantly from the day it finished and back into theatres. Uh, and for the you know those on the front line, that still matters. That is still an impact. Um, so thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, I don't think she's still there in the background, but um, yeah, it, really honest and really good. So thank you. And just to warn Lorraine, you're still off mute. If you can try and mute yourself. Okay. Thank you very much, Palmer. Thank you very much, everybody else, for your contribution. Comments or questions on any of that, please. Um, and we'll go, yes, Jill and then Elena. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and thank you, team, for um, the, the, the great insight into your journey over the last couple of years. I, I think we should adopt this the slogan, never forget, because those of the, us that aren't involved in day-to-day clinical services can perhaps be forgiven for getting sometimes the impact that COVID's had on you. Um, uh, but we must never forget to thank you and acknowledge the work that you've done. So that was the first thing. The second thing is that um, I had the privilege of um, attending a theatre where the robot um, that I think Katie mentioned was in action. Um, And the atmosphere in the theatre was amazing. People were so excited. I think it's one of the really good things that has... um, uh, kind of helped theatre staff to think, yes, there's a future and it, and it can be different and better. So I wanted to commend uh, Hamant and his team for getting the robot in, training everybody and getting things in place so quickly. Absolutely amazing. Uh, a, a couple of other things, if I may. So one of the things as non-executive directors we do is walkabouts. And a couple of things that I discovered in my theatre walk, walkabouts was firstly that things have changed very much since I trained as a nurse, where we had to do three months mandatory experience in a theatre. 
this is no longer mandatory. And so one of the student nurses was telling me that um, uh, many nurses now don't consider theatres as a, a, as a career because they don't have the opportunity to see what it's like. And it can be a bit frightening. So Debbie and I have discussed that. Debbie is director of nursing and she's going to make sure that all nurses are offered that opportunity and training so we can begin to think about careers for theatre nurses going forward. And then finally, I just wondered if anybody had done any analysis on, because um, Katie mentioned the fact that we don't pay our ODPs a similar salary to those in other hospitals. Um, but we, we end up having to have agency ODPs in, which, of course, as we know, is incredibly expensive. So I wondered if um, we had done the financial an analysis to see if actually upgrading our ODPs to band sixes could be justified because we would um, potentially invite perhaps more people to apply for posts with us. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, sure, several people picked up on the band six comment, so we'll just keep we'll leave that to a little bit later. Elena, and then David, please. Um, thank you, Alan, and um, thanks uh, a lot to the day surgery team. Uh, I really admire your resilience and your commitment to to help people, to help colleagues, because of you. Uh, we managed to save so many lives, so huge thank you. But of course, all your hard work comes uh, at cost, uh, at cost um, for your mental health and um, to the extent what you have experienced could be classified uh, as a trauma. So um, my question is, um, how can we help um, you and other uh, medical nurses, HCAs, who went through all this um, to, to basically come through this experience, process it, heal the wounds and uh, boost your resilience and morale. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, David. Sorry, I was just trying to navigate my way to the off mute button. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Jet. Uh, yeah, and that was a really great presentation from the theatre team. Thank you very, very much. And, you know, I echo the comments which Elena has made about resilience and commitment in the face of the many, many challenges that you have out there and have experienced. My question is a very simple one. We're the board. Um, if you have a wish list, which you presumably do, what item is at the top of that wish list to help you in your job as you move forward? Okay, thank you for that. Does anybody like to come back on any of those questions before I go to Heidi and Mark at all? This is your opportunity, guys. Go on. Yeah, go on, Katie. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think one of the, one of the biggest things is um, is really that, that kind of staffing. Um, you know, if you have enough people, then you can release people to do their training and development. You can improve retention. It's all quite cyclical. You know, you have that time to release people for those um, morale boosting activities um, that, that we've sort of talked about. And, and obviously we do, um, sort of going back to the question about boosting morale, we, we did do a reset week where we did a lot of reflective stuff, we, a lot of supportive things. Um, we really had a big push on meaningful recognition and that's something we continue to promote so using great ticks um, and terrific tuesday um thank you cards all those things that we that we can do compliments corners and things like that um but at the top of my I, it's a bit rich for me to say because i've left now as matron um but my wish list would would be to be able to to get more staff in and if that that would potentially mean paying a a competitive band. I agree, Katie. Can I just come in on some of those elements as well? Um, obviously, the, the the banding for the ODPs is, uh, I think, it is a really really important issue. Um, I think we will attract and retain a lot of good members of the team um, if if we can compete with other hospitals on that on that front. Um, I think certainly for me as a, a theatre manager. 
the the right equipment I touched on for the day as well. We've had so much so much equipment go missing over over COVID that we've had to replace. Um, I have I have got quite a long list <laughs> on my board here in the office, um, which I'm more than willing to share with people if <laughs> if they're interested. Um, and also interested, Elena, on the, on the grounds of of supporting staff with their mental health and well being. I can only thank the SOS team within the trust uh, and occupational health. Uh, I think the, I've never done so many occupational health referrals or SOS referrals um, in in the last, in all my career really as a, as a band seven theatre manager, as I have done in the last two years. And the feedback from staff about the help they've received and actually how that's impacted um, on their lives and made a real difference. I mean, obviously with mental health, I think it is something that you are constantly revisiting, um, but the fact that that service is there for the staff is invaluable. Okay, thank you guys. Heidi and then Mark. Thanks Chair. So a few things obviously to thank everybody for coming today. Um, and being really honest and open with us. So um, on some of the points raised, I've been fortunate to spend some time with Katie in theatre, um, went in this week, spent some time with um, Margaret, who um, is a senior nurse in theatre too, and also spent some time with Nikki, who oversees um, the ODP work. Um, and for me, it's, it's not just the competitive nature between us and other hospitals, actually. We've got different banding even within our hospital for ODP. So that's something thing that I've asked Debbie and Nikki is working on now because actually there's different competencies within ODP so I think it's a real opportunity for us Nikki's doing some great work um, but there's more for us to do in that area so it it needs to be a real focus and is a real focus for us at the moment so Debbie is supporting that um, in terms of the well-being really good point Elena I I feel a real difference in theatre when I go in, in terms of the impact. It doesn't mean it's worse or, you know, um, it just means it's a bit different, I think. Um, and so I've spoken to um, Claire Hallis and Tracy about actually on a wider sense, do we need to do um, different events, almost like a memorial, which might not sound like the most exciting word, but it's about closure. It's about, you know, what we can take from it positively, what we need to understand. So we're just thinking about how we do continue to acknowledge the impact and really think about the importance of not um, moving on to Jill's point in the way that we obviously do in the community in our day to day lives. So I think there's still quite a bit we need to do um, in critical care, in theatres um, and across the hospital in terms of the well-being. But as Debbie said, SOS and um, occupational health have been phenomenal. Um, and, and I think it's also important to acknowledge the hardworking theatre when we're under pressure on the urgent loads care pathway. They're constantly thinking about how they can still continue to deliver um, our elective pathway or our um, elective care for our cancer patients in particular. And so being incredibly innovative, not just working in teams in main theatres or MDSU, um, but actually how they're working across. So that's a real positive and really important for the board to acknowledge. Mark. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to everybody in terms of the story this morning, uh, to Joe, Debbie, Katie and Ruth and, and Katie, congratulations on your new role. And uh, what, what a way to start it uh, in the board meeting. So I was just going to follow up many other points, actually very similar to that of Heidi's. Of course, you'd expect me to come in on the banding situation. So I think there's a real piece of work there clearly for us to work out on a regional basis. But I think it extends that because our region is classed as the Midlands and within the Midlands, we've been doing some work on making sure we don't move in these sorts of positions where we just compete for the same people by pay inflation, essentially. Um, but I'm conscious that the Midlands doesn't necessarily cater to the south of the M1. So we just need or to the west of the M1. So we need to um, be more considerate to that and look into that position. And given that it is the number one thing on, on the wish list has been articulated, I think that's really important to look at that. But ultimately, what we do know is that the root cause for some of these issues is the training and development and the app and the uh, not the appetite, but the enthusiasm in order to go into those roles. So I think Jill makes a really valid point in regards to people rotating through theatres as part of their training programme to understand just how good a career that could possibly be for individuals. And also this one of movement. I know this is something clearly we suffer within the staff survey and it's something we need to look at because that everybody wishes to stay in their place of work because that's where they're employed to um, undertake those duties, of course. 
but perhaps we do need to look at protecting certain areas and um, that is something that's clearly impacting then on training and development and, and as, as was pointed out in regards to absence I totally agree to the sort of reset follow-up Paddy I think there's definitely a piece of work to do around that I'm not sure what, what we call it similarly but it's there's definitely got to be a piece of work it's the rest of the world continues to move on and that's fine and that's part of the world but but we can't um, because of what people have experienced in our organization so I think it's really important that we continue to recognize that and the fact it hasn't gone away I think that's a really important part too if we look at we're on wave three of just this year um, we're seeing the same absence levels as we were seeing in March and January now so it's it's just really important we continue to keep touching in with people and making sure that we um, uh, can can try and achieve something more positive and, and just recognize what people have been through thank you anybody else at all how do your hands back up just pause for a minute anybody else at all um yes Hammond, and then we'll come to heidi thanks sir uh, i completely echo uh, what uh, my colleagues in theaters uh, being a surgeon uh, i've also gone through that experience but i just want to emphasize uh, to the board uh, the innovative pathways uh, which uh, they have helped to implement not only the robot uh, but a couple of pathways like ambulatory laser uh, bladder cancer treatments the immunofluorescence uh, sentinel lymph node for gynecological cancers these are really innovative very few trusts to it and in addition to all the covid pressures the innovative pathways have been phenomenal in terms of uh, uh, implementation so i just wanted to add that thank you Heidi. So I was going to cover that too, but also because um, I think it's important to acknowledge the innovation that's continuing. Um, but also on the ODP, um, we're really trying to think of different ways of working. And I spoke to an incredibly passionate group of nurses this week in theatres. I went in um, and they were talking about really thinking innovatively about how nurses can be upskilled to do multiple jobs so that actually when we're under pressure, the flexibility to, to move around is much more confidently done from a competency perspective etc for those that would like to do that so it's just really to acknowledge some of the team are full of ideas and passion so Helen Midbetter is going to pick that up with with theatres to look at that opportunity as well. Anybody else? No? Okay thank you very much guys that was a really good presentation it's um it was particularly difficult for theatres during Covid because moving from short-term care of somebody for an hour or two into effectively full-time critical care units was a pretty difficult transition for people to make. Um, and as you rightly point out, all the face injuries, all the all the tight masks, the face fit, and all the other things that were new to people were particularly difficult. And that's hard when your team is, is spread around the place. But going forward, um, when we talk about the efficiency theatre efficiency programme, it sounds as if it's sort of all about driving efficiency, but actually, and, and um, just as this presentation went on, I was thinking that's maybe not a great title. It might be the outcome we're looking for, but it's more of a theatre opportunities and uh, opportunities for staff, opportunities for um, all sorts of people to think about how this could be better. So um, coming to the ODP thing, I mean, clearly there's a massive difference between sitting in Northampton and competing with Oxford and uh, and Milton Keynes and places and sitting in North Staffordshire and, and competing with somewhere in Wales. Um, so, you know, we need to think very carefully about that. And we shouldn't, you know, we, we, we can't be in a position where we're losing our staff to the south um, because of that sort of thing. We have to think our way around that. So I'd look for something to come back pretty quickly to the people committee on what we're doing about theatre grades, please. Um, on, the, on the other stuff, I think, you know, when you talk, it's a long time since I've been in a working theatre, um, but, well, not that long, maybe three or four years, but, but um, you know, the whole business is one of getting the right patient in the right order with the right team, with the right equipment. And you've talked today mostly about the team and the equipment, and I'm sure somebody has picked up today on the theatre equipment list that's missing, and we'll start to think about what we can do about that. And we know we've talked about the ODP thing and the recruitment to that. But the business of the process that gets the patient there in the right order is, uh, is, is a major part of this. And when you talk to patients and surgical patients in the hospital, they're often very complimentary about the actual, the actual bit that happens, if you like. They tend to be less complimentary about the admin with multiple appointments being offered and be confusing about where those things are and 
um, difficulty in understanding what they're meant to do when they come in. So I think a lot, let's not get into a position where we think this is a theatre problem as opposed to a theatre flow problem. And it starts with the admin, it starts with the planning, it starts with empowering the teams to uh, and training the teams to understand what average theatre times are, uh, how they should, what, what, as you pointed out, somebody pointed out, you know, putting the wrong kind of cases on a day theatre list. I mean, that is a big training exercise. It's about experience. It's about empowering. And the final bit about it is getting theatres to start on time. If you do your nephrectomy and it's going to take three or four hours, if you start two hours late, it's not going to work very well, is it? So the whole business of, um, of how these things start on time becomes crucial. So I'm just thinking, Becky, as you lead the theatre programme with, with across the piece and with Heidi in Northampton, I think we might look for this to come back to a board or maybe a board development session might be a better description where we can spend a bit more time on how this thing is going and talk to some of the theatre people um, in, in a more uh, more face-to-face -face way, perhaps. And I'm thinking maybe October or, or um, December. But we'll come back to that later and think about how we might do that just to uh, just to get make sure we're getting a, a board level focus on what it is we want to happen here. OK, everybody, thank you very much for that. It was a good presentation. Thank you for putting together, Palmer. Thank you for all the, all the staff from theatre. Um, I hope you find it helpful, uh, even cathartic a little bit, which is quite part of the process. But also, I hope you think the board might uh, might be in a position to respond as a board should to what to the points you've made today. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody, um, minutes and previous meeting, uh, minutes on 27th of May, are you happy to refer record? And uh, the action log is pretty well complete. There's a little bit about comms, KPIs, but that's deferred pending the appointment of. All happy? Yes, and you do all know, I think, that we failed to appoint a group director of comms, and there's now some thinking about how to improve the chances of recruiting that. Uh, I do think in general, um, people are people might be underestimating the effect of not having effective group comms for over a year now. However, um, we just have to tackle that problem going forward. Okay, Chair's report, I don't have much to say really. Um, the first thing is simply to note that the ICB now exists, the Integrated Care Board now exists and had its first meeting, which it actually chose to, do, to, to devote to development type of workshops, um, which, you know, they're a necessary part of building a new team. But I think uh, I think it's going to take a lot of a lot of there's a lot of hope and expectation for what the integrated care board might do. And certainly there is determination amongst most, if not all of the people around the table to make a difference. But it is a huge agenda and a huge problem and deciding what to focus on is going to be difficult. I think further later on today, maybe in the private session, we've got something about the community diagnostic centres. And it seems to me that the opportunities in the ICB around digital and estates are probably the biggest opportunities to make a difference in the short term. The other thing to say is it's been a really rough few weeks in the hospital. Critical incidents declared both Heidi's report, Simon's report given by Mark, um, Palmer and the IGI, they all talk about how difficult it's been. And um, certainly over the worst period of the critical incident time and the heat wave and so on, where these hospitals are not designed for heat waves, um, it was pretty, pretty rough. And um, thanking staff for going the extra mile doesn't really sort of do it. They went an extra several miles for the most part, I think. And it was pretty difficult with, um, I know Heidi was going around stealing fans from offices to put into patient areas. And somebody told me that there was a, um, some delivery rooms in the mat unit that don't have air conditioning and there was a child born with so many fans around them they're thinking of calling them hurricane um so it was all very difficult lots of people very active lots of people trying to do all sorts of things to make it better but it was pretty rough and the demand was pretty enormous so let's just uh, let's just note that before simon in the guise of mark and then heidi tell us just how bad it was okay thank you very much mark Thank you, Chair. Uh, Simon in the guise of Mark, that's an introduction and a half. So um, I'll do my best Mark impression as opposed to Simon impression. Um, and, and essentially, I was going to start the report exactly as you've just finished yours, which was just to, again, just once again, publicly thank everybody for the huge amount of work and effort that's gone in during the heat wave, which, of course, was intense. Um, I think it's everybody who cares for everybody is critically important. We've also got those 
who support those who care and looking after things such as making sure that our computer systems work and our estates infrastructure doesn't collapse upon us is, is really, really important. Um, and so it's really important that we thank all of those colleagues. And as you rightly say, we've also been um, hugely pressurised in our emergency care um, uh, non-elective scenarios in the recent past. And Heidi's going to come on to that in, in, in her presentation shortly. So I'm not going to go into that in a huge amount of detail. And taking on Simon's report, it's interesting because activity and theatre utilisation is obviously coming up on our agenda too later, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail um, with regards to that. I think it is important to pause and stop on, on and reflect on our, us launching our Dedicated to Excellence Hour. So this was part of our April board development session whereby how can we um, support and encourage, we've just heard from our theatre staff, so all of the ideas that those colleagues have, how can we make sure we give them time and some investment uh, in order to make those um, come to life and, and to happen and to improve um, their work experience. We know that was one of the critical factors for, we know it's a critical factor for motivation, and we know people have got ideas around improvement, it's important that we empower them um, to do so. So I wasn't going to go too much more into that, I'm certainly not going to thank myself um, as part of the report, I'll leave that to you Chairman, I know that you're looking forward to that, um, and I will leave it there. Should I come in, Alan? Um, yeah. Um, okay, so thanks, Mark. I'll thank you, um, obviously, Alan will, but um, I think, you know, you've made a huge difference. I've, I've only worked with you for a year and um, you're an incredible colleague and you've made a real difference to all of us. So can't thank you enough, won't make it too, um, too detailed because I know you're not enjoying it, but it's really important we do publicly acknowledge you as a NGH team. So thank you. Um, so, and on, moving on from that, I think I'd really like to start with, as Alan said, a huge, huge thank you to our teams across the hospital, not just for during the heat wave, but that was a really good example of teamwork that you just couldn't describe, you know, people coming out of their normal day to day roles to ensure our patients, our teams were hydrated. Um, um, Alan's obviously highlighted, we were all getting in stuck into making sure everybody was checked on, supported in a planned way, but also in real time. So, um, and it isn't as Mark said, it isn't just, um, obviously, we think about the clinical frontline, there are particular wards that um, environmentally got a lot hotter, um, but things like our digital teams making sure um, our systems were cooled enough to make sure they continued, etc. So a huge, huge thank you to everybody because it was pretty phenomenal seeing the teamwork, including our volunteers going around with ice pops. Um, so um, I'll move on to the urgent emergency care pathway, which I've covered in my report. Um, it's safe to say this continues to be incredibly challenged. Um, now this is a picture and Palmer will cover it more um, later, but this is a real picture of us building up the number of patients in the hospital that do not need to be in an acute setting and therefore the bed base that we have to work with um, is is smaller of those we can turn around um, to not need care packages, for example. So. Um, there has been some phenomenal work, still more to do internally, and we continue to look at what we can do to improve patient experience flow ourselves internally, and equally what we can do to work with the system. But it's important to cite the board that we continue to be challenged and we don't have full confidence that we have enough plans across the system um, ahead of winter in all areas. We continue to work really collaboratively, um, Becky and um, on ICANN and some of the work with Pathway 2 um, is much clearer in terms of what we will be doing, but does obviously carry a risk of recruitment. Um, pathway 0, Pathway 0 is basically patients that we can get home and don't, don't need care packages. Our length of stay is improving, so thank you to all the teams for their hard work on that. But there continues to be um, some of the people that need to go out into the community, significant delays. So we continue to work really strongly with the system on what those plans need to look like. Um, and obviously Alan alluded to the ICB, obviously we're having to really focus on certain areas. Um, and this obviously is one of them. Um, one of the things that we, we still don't have in the west of the county is an urgent treatment center. We know that our ED is considered to be too small for the number of attendances. GERFT suggested eight major cubicles too small, and we don't have an urgent treatment centre either. Um, so we stream as many patients as we can away, um, but Polly and the system are looking at what a solution for that 
might be, but we are in July and that we don't have a confirmed um, resolution for that. So that is a risk we continue to carry as a system. So it's important to note that. Um, we went on to, in, to internal incident last Thursday, um, as um, Alan referred to, and that was because of the significant pressure of patients in who did not need to be in the hospital and lack of flow of out of the hospital and coupled with the number of people attending our emergency department. And we felt we needed to go on internal incident following our protocols because of the pressure, particularly at the front door and safety. Um, we did have a really good response, um, had the highest number of discharged on Thursday and Friday than we've had for a long time, um, but we need to continue that and the teams are continuing to work incredibly hard. Palmer's updated this morning in terms of confidence, continued pressure, but confidence in discharges, but it's taken a significant toll on the teams working at that intensity all the time. Um, so obviously we, we're focusing on well-being and creating environments for people to speak up, raise concerns, bring ideas through our Connect, Explore, Improve um, sessions across the hospital. Um, I've covered the financial position in my report, but I won't go into too much detail on that. Um, it's just to note really, obviously, that is um, challenged in terms of the impact of the urgent emergency care pathway on our elective pathway. But John and Palmer and Becky will cover some of that throughout the agenda. Um, important to acknowledge our um, cancer performance still remains um, really good in terms of where we sit compared to our peers. Still more work to do. We still would like to see our patients even sooner, but it's really important to acknowledge, particularly in light of the patients and the staff stories today, of the hard work that goes into making sure that we continue to focus on our cancer patients as a priority, um, and that shows in our performance. Um, on that note, obviously, we've um, said we our ambition around a cancer centre of excellence, and we had a really successful day bringing together um, over 70 clinicians, um, admin teams, etc., from across the system and within the group to start the journey of defining that ambition and what that really means. We were really fortunate to have Professor Sir Mike Richards come and join us to give us a real objective challenge around what that ambition really means for patients, what obviously his, his um, breadth of experience around community diagnostics, screening, and having been national cancers are, meant he was really well placed to do that. Um, uh, so that was a really successful day, so important to note. Also, our ITU has opened. Um, and the teams have been supported in the transition into the new ITU, so it's really important to acknowledge the hard work from um, our estates teams led by Stuart and Paul um, and everybody within the teams clinically working together, so really good example of teamwork again. Um, and obviously it's a state of the art um, environment, which is, is fabulous for our teams and patients. We've also opened our new restaurant. Um, uh, it, was being um, redesigned so that it was a much nicer space for our teams and our patients. And it's really important to note that this is hoping to be a much more space for well-being too, so that people can take time out um, on their breaks properly. Um, so, and it's been really successful, 24 hour opening. So that's being trialed to see if that's something that makes a real difference to our teams and, um, and relatives that might be visiting. So, um, and that's going really well. So it's really important to note that and thank the teams for that. We've also um, been successful in being um, shortlisted for two H HSJ awards for the work around deteriorating patient. They presented earlier this week, so we just wait to find out how they did. So a huge thank you to um, Jonathan Hardwick and Charlotte Hoodless who presented on our behalf. Um, and then maternity, obviously um, it continues to be um, one of our priorities, carrying a level of risk as um, a number of units across the country in terms of the shortest of midwives, et cetera, but we are covering that more on the agenda. Um, so um, we'll cover that then, if that's okay. Okay, any questions on any of that at all, or any comments? Uh, Elena. Uh, yes, um, thank you very much, and of course, huge, Thank you to the staff because we already said uh, our gratitude to the um, uh, our uh, staff team who was presenting earlier today. But entire uh, trust staff were doing really great uh, job during the last few months and last few years. Um, I would like to 
formulate my question combining both reports, Heidi's and uh, Simon's. Um, Heidi has emphasized uh, the pressure, the pressure at our front door and the huge challenges in terms of the discharges. Uh, Simon gave, gave us a glimpse of hope in his report saying that the partners have agreed to consolidate uh, all community beds under an HFT, Mental Health and Community Trust, and also to support additional beds being open. My question is, how many community beds are available right now and how many more has to be open for us not to have medically optimized patients residing in our uh, facility? And are the plans which Simon refers to match our needs? Thank you. Yeah, okay. David and then um, Becky. It was a very similar question I had concerning um, concerning community beds, in fact, and, uh, you know, we had spoken, we have spoken a number of times about whether we need to try and um, have our own uh, beds, but evidently the, uh, the ICB has decided that it's going to be uh, an HFT, which is going to do that. My, my, my second question is a uh, quite, quite a simple one to Heidi, really, and it's how is the critical care unit going after its first month, first month of operation? And... Uh, Hopefully, Stuart, it was designed with air conditioning. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, Becky, and then we'll go to Heidi or whoever to answer the last two. Becky. I was going to try and respond to David's point, um, if that's all right. Um, so the pathway to um, proposal, it, it's made up of two main things. So one is recovering independence beds, which is consolidating the current specialist care centre beds and uh, under the same model as the community hospital beds, um, which will increase the cohort of patients that they are able to take, um, particularly within the specialist care centres. Um, and uh, secondly, to um, provide a greater number of acute confusion beds, um, which at the moment there isn't um, much capacity within the system for. Um, so the local authorities are spot purchasing those at great cost to the system um, and they are not always uh, available. So it should provide us with a route to be able to um, support those, that cohort of patients as well. Um, so the proposal, which has been supported by system um, chief executives increases the number of um, pathway two beds by 38 across the system um, from the number that we currently have. We currently have around 101. Um, but the major thing, the major difference is that at the moment we are unable really to use some of the specialist care centre beds because of the restriction in in um, criteria of patients that we can discharge into them. Um, so it should increase um, the number of discharges that we're able to make into pathway two beds by around 60 a month, um, which is um, quite substantial. Um, however, um, there is, it's not like the proposals agreed and it will come in to place. Um, so there is a period where that is now going through implementation. Um, it's very heavily reliant on recruitment. Um, there are around 150 staff who need to be recruited. Um, there is a risk to us as a system as to where do those staff come from? Do they come from some of, well, either Kettering or Northampton hospitals or from um, other services within NHFT in terms of looking after people at home? Um, so it is not without risk as, as a plan. Um, we're monitoring it really carefully, both through the system coups group that Palmer sits on and also through the ICANN delivery board. Um, so it, it's got... Um, it's got some governance and assurance around it, but it, it is a it is a high risk plan. Um, and finally, I'd say this is a pilot for this year around moving the beds underneath NHFT management um, for the specialist care centres. Um, and the intention is to develop as a system an outcomes and performance based contract for community services, um, looking at what that means as ICANN transitions from a programme into a collaborative that will be commissioned. Um, so uh, the pilot phase is under the management of NHFT. And then as a system, we'll be looking at putting that under a performance and outcomes based contract. OK, that's very helpful. I think I would say that. The expertise for running community services and these types of re rehab services is, is a very particular expertise. 
and um, uh, we shouldn't pretend we're good at everything, really. Um, so I'm quite pleased where it's going. I think the other thing I'd say is I'm not entirely sure this deal is nailed down. Um, because although, as Becky rightly pointed out, I don't, I don't know whether she was intending to make the distinction, but this was agreed by the chief execs. That's not quite the same thing as agreed. So um, we just have to try hard to make sure that is followed through all the way. Heidi, uh, Jill and then Heidi. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to make the quick point that, of course, um, community care isn't just about beds, as we all know. Dan and I have done a couple of board rounds recently and um, seen some fantastic work with the health colleagues working together in a, a multidisciplinary way, but um, being frustrated by um, the lack of care packages in the community, which are, are again related to staffing issues and also processes. So in, Becky and I have had a discussion about um, whether we need to engage social workers in, in these board rounds or uh, because they're or, or a finite resource, whether we need to push on with the trusted assessor model so that um, uh, we can stop having a, um, a health social care divide pathway. So there's, there's an awful lot of work going on around um, care packages as well as beds. Yeah, I, I, I accept all that. I just make the point we're in July. And uh, here comes January kind of thing. Anyway, Palmer and then Heidi. Just to come back on your point, Joey, you're absolutely right. The pathway, what we've been talking about largely, pathway two, pathway one, there is a lot of work also being done on this. Uh, and that's about mainly around contracting. And they have a bizarre world at the moment where, for example, through flexible working, they might have 900 hours of visits capable capacity on a Monday, but only 500 on a Wednesday. So you can't actually discharge the 900 on a Monday because you will run out by Wednesday. So they are rechanging the, the entire contracting system. They're doing, again, takes a long time, carries slightly less risk than the pathway to work. But there, again, there is risk uh, um, involved in it. There's risk to us, obviously, with staff and all that kind of thing. So we have largely agreed a package of uh, actions that we want to take across all the pathways at the moment, because you acknowledge that it's not just about the SEC beds, it's about getting back home. Okay, thank you. Heidi. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I'll answer all the points. Um, so um, I think it is important to acknowledge the significant amount of work across the system, everybody working together, but as Becky highlighted, um, and I articulated in my report, the risk is around recruitment, whether that's social care um, recruiting, whether that is NHFT recruiting into the community beds, because some of this may be moving people around the system or inability to recruit completely. So that is the, the significant risk we, we are carrying from my perspective. Um, in terms of, um, but we are, Jill's point is really good. We're thinking of more different ways we can work. Um, and even Stuart um, Lackenby, the Director of Adult Social Care in the West of the County, we've spoken very recently about how we, as an acute setting, try to drive quality and competence in care homes to prevent some admissions as well. That is part of some of the system work anyway, but how we target that a lot more focused way, um, because obviously there's a huge advantage, not only to us as an acute setting to prevent admissions, but it's the right thing to do morally um, to improve the experience of people in care homes. So that's something else that we're discussing as well. Okay. Oh, and I didn't, sorry, I didn't answer the ITU question for David. Um, yes, it is air conditioned, obviously, um, but um, it's it's gone well, David. Um, it, it obviously had its challenges in terms of a new environment. You have to keep a really have a environment where people can raise concerns around if there's anything they're worried about. Um, and that happened. It happened really well so that there was open discussion, um, really focused work around that. But um, I'd say that the initial niggles now are um oh, everybody is in a really good place in terms of um obviously a really new environment and we continue to acknowledge there may be things that raise concern in terms of change of working but yeah largely positive yeah it's taken a while to get it open but it's it's good and the staff do take a while to get used to a new environment particularly in critical care and of course one with single rooms makes life just a little bit different about how people operate but anyway um just uh Yes, I was, okay, I'm not going to summarise all of that. That's, we understand the problem, there's a lot of work going on, and um, 
we wish you well in taking it forward. Integrated governance report. We're running a little bit behind time, guys. So if you could just remind you that the purpose of this is what do you wish to bring to the attention of the board? Uh, rather than simply a report on what you discussed in your committees. I'm sure you know that. So um, over to Heidi to organise the uh, and to make happen on time the IGR report for the board. Thank you, Heidi. Over to you. I accept the challenge, Chair. Um, so as Alan said, if we can really focus on what we want the board to be cited on, um, so we do have time for any questions. Um, so I'll go straight into conscious of time. I will go straight into um, the committees because um, we've covered largely the things I would have wanted to highlight on the agenda. So I'll go straight into quality governance committee um, and hand over to Andre and then bring in Hemant and Helen if there's anything they want to add. So over to you, Andre. Thanks, Heidi. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll just uh, be brief and uh, uh, bring up the salient points of the last two quality governance committees that we've had since the last board meeting uh, in, in May. Um, basically, since the uh, May board meeting, we've moved back to monthly hospital-based uh, quality governance committee. So we had one in June. Um, one of the things that we, we uh, have been focusing on and has been flagging up uh, on a regular basis is the maternity staffing issues uh, with regard to recruitment, which we've heard a lot about, and also the uh, felt vacancies, which at uh, in, in uh, June were sitting at around 43, 44. Uh, so obviously it's something that we, we've been monitoring, uh, which I'll come back to in the July uh, meeting, which I'll mention in a bit. At that time, towards the end of June, uh, we felt that we wanted to focus on the medicine, morbidity and mortality meetings because they had not been reconvened at that stage. But since then, there has been uh, an upturn in the COVID numbers. Again, we appreciate that there's a fair bit of uh, clinical front door uh, firefighting there. But obviously, this is something that we uh, are keeping an eye on uh, in the quality committee. In terms of the quality uh, report, we had a an update on the academic strategy, um, which was good. And we had uh, a lot of um, good news about the momentum of recruitment to clinical studies and also alignment with the University of Leicester uh, in terms of the academic um, plans. And this is an item which is on the, uh, on, on the, um, the meeting pack, but something still under embargo. Uh, but I think I'm allowed to say that there is good news in terms of uh, the groups uh, uh, alignment with the University of Leicester and University Hospital of Leicester in putting forward an NIHR a bid for a new biomedical research center because it requires ministerial sign off and it didn't happen before the recess. So I think we'll, we'll be waiting for after the summer to hear of that good news. That's probably all that I can say at this point in time. Um, IGR um, is an ongoing work in process, uh, progr uh, in progress and um, I think we felt that we have good um, detail and assurance in the quality report, which I'll summarize at the end. Uh, so the IGR was there for us to, to look at and also maybe uh, comment on areas of uh, improvement to harmonize the uh, metrics comparison across uh, the group. So it is something that we, we look at, but we focus on the discussion based on the quality reports, which helps uh, more with our discussions at the committee. And uh, at the end of a June meeting, we also had a, uh, uh, an update on pharmacy's work from chief pharmacist and endorsed the medicine optimization strategy, which was a, a, a great piece of work. And we were very happy to receive that. Moving on to the July meeting, which we had uh, last week, um, coming back to the maternity uh, felt vacancies, it's now gone up to 50, which is obviously not something that we like to see. Um, it's certainly something that uh, needs more um, discussion and a strategy. There is a deep dive on the Ockenden report in relation to that and maternity seminar to look uh, at maternity safety at the beginning of August. So hopefully that will uh, give us a little bit more of a, a steer towards how to manage this uh, uh, situation. Uh, we also received a, a very detailed urgent care report between June and July, and we appreciate the, the, the enormous amount of hard work that uh, all the staff and colleagues are doing uh, in the front end, and especially the, with the current pressures, which are not unique to, to, to us, but also nationally. Um, we continue to look at the ED and also um, 
look at ways to, to smooth in the processes, how to improve some of the metrics that we see. And uh, we, we are happy in the committee that uh, all the uh, things that needed to be done are being done and, and there's a strategy in place to uh, manage the ongoing uh, pressures. Something to celebrate is perhaps the um, significant improvement in our mortality metrics, uh, in, especially in terms of the HSMR, uh, which is uh, comparing a lot better than our peers in the region uh, and has gone to uh, below expected range on mortality. Uh, the shimmy is uh, is continued as an as expanded range. So uh, there's a lot of work obviously in relation to this uh, because this is the HSMR is mortality, including discharge, the 30 day mortality after the hospital discharge. So clearly this is um, a reflection of the enormous amount of work and also the uh, procedures in place to uh, keep that, uh, to, to improve on the mortality situation of the trust. So. Uh, there is a significant evidence of a closing of the gap between the weekend and weekday mortality. So that significantly contributes towards that HSMR uh, good news. And obviously we continue to try to understand that uh, data and uh, map to the procedures that had gone before that to, to achieve that result. And hopefully we'll be able to share some good practices across, across the group. And I think perhaps finally, we have started to see some um, a good implementation over the last six months. I think we had been a little bit distracted by the volume of, of information in IGR, and now coming back to the quality reports, which have seen a significant um, uh, help in the committee to focus on useful, meaningful, and also efficient discussions. Uh, we felt that um, the quality of the quality committee discussions had in, improved, and also we are in, in a better position to provide or achieve assurance during the committee meetings and, and achieving um, uh, the, all the agenda items without actually um, running out of time. So this is, I think, it's a significant improvement over the last six months. Um, and we've highlighted all the exec and paper owners to highlight three items to celebrate and three items to, of concern to raise uh, uh, the, the discussion points so that we can actually focus on, on useful discussion during the committee. So I think uh, that is a, 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 a good thing that we are seeing. So I perhaps would stop there and would value any uh, input from other colleagues. Thanks, Andre. I know Hemant's covering mortality later on the agenda, so you may want to cover that in detail later. Hemant, um, Helen, Helen. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, just a couple of things. Thank you, Andre, um, summarizing. Um, in terms of nursing, um, our three top concerns um, were midwifery, and um, urgent care, and they're going to be covered in other reports. Um, and then harms. So just a couple of comments really about harms. Um, so C. diff, um, so Clostridium difficile infections, you'll see by our report that we had another 10 cases in June. Um, first of all, can I just also just thank Holly and Basil. Uh, we have an incredible um, infection program the infection prevention control team who support us all clinically um, and work endlessly and it's just a reminder really that um, although we are still in COVID we do have other uh, microorganisms and infections in the, um, in the hospital. So as you know we were set a trajectory of 51 cases this year so um, we are on trajectory to exceed that. Um, but Holly was able to provide us with assurance one of the reasons is that we're now including type five stools so because we are detecting more or testing more we're going to detect more but more importantly the ribosomes of, of each of those cases was different so we are confident that it's not a cross-infection issue um, and the, the most likely theme is around antibiotic usage and prescribing um, and then just secondly um, on your um, in your pack on uh, page 57 which is about falls just a point of accuracy the graph says five this actually translates to three actual um, moderate to harm falls um, in the organization in June um, two of those um, cases there was no learning from and one was just a little bit of local learning there is a huge amount of work being done with Lizzie Lomax who is our falls lead team um, particularly around post falls learning and the immediacy of that um, and the closer to the event, the better. Um, 
So there is a huge amount of work to be done. And also just in terms of the IGR with nursing metrics, uh, Debbie and Fiona, myself, will be meeting to make sure that uh, KGH and NGH are aligned, that we are confident in what we're measuring. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Um, Helen? Thanks, Adi. Uh, just a quick point is, uh, uh, is mortality will be covering later. In addition uh, to uh, the embargoed Biomedical Research Center for Leicester, uh, however, the clinical research facility, which was a joint bid between the University of Leicester and Northampton has been successful, and that will extrapolate into improvement in access to phase two clinical trials for the entire county. So I just wanted to add that point. Thank you. Thanks, Herman. Um, so continuing with the challenge on time that we have, um, if we can keep focused on key points for the board to be cited on, um, I'll move on to finance and performance and bring in David Palmer and John. So David. I'm happy to pick this one up if that's okay. Heidi. I can just do the key, the, uh, the highlight the main points if you like, John. Um, I won't do June. I wasn't at the June meeting and a lot of it is duplicated in July. Um, you know, I think a couple of business cases were approved at the meeting that was held yesterday. The first one was the EPR, that's the Electronic Patient Record Outline case. Um, incredibly important to the trust. It's transformational, um, you know, both in terms of digitization, but also I think in terms of patient care. And the second, um, the second business case that was approved was the uh, the Midlands Pathology Network, which is a a joint piece of work. I think I'm right in saying this between Kettering or between the group Kettering in Northampton and University Hospitals uh, Leicester. And I think the clue there is in the name, it is a network, a pathology network. Um, just to mention on EPR, uh, the board will be discussing uh, this uh, at its private meeting uh, later on today. Um, other points there, uh, I, I think um, board assurance framework, I think all committees have received a paper from, from Richard on the board assurance framework and specifically on harmonization of the risks um, we did receive a report, to, uh, report an update on TIF, uh, specifically on outpatients. It was well received. It seems to be going well. And additional funding has been made available to ensure uh, implementation of this very important project. Um, IGR, I think we're going to hear a lot from, um, from Palmer about that later. And on Finance Month 3, I think John will also be speaking speaking to that suffice to say that um, we did not make plan in month three there were there were reasons for that um, uh, hopefully we will recover but I think the committee was somewhat concerned about the the multiple challenges which we were facing in terms of making our financial plan for 22-23 so I'll leave it at that John if you want to uh, sorry I overrode you at the beginning but if you want to add to uh, uh, my comments that's not a problem at all, David. So, um, so yeah, um, so in terms of the, the the financial performance, just to give a little bit more colour on it. So we were to year to date to the end of month three, so June, we were two point two million pounds worse than plan. That's a deficit of five point eight million. Um, of that two point two million pounds, about two of that um, result is as a result of not earning elective recovery fund income that we um, had planned to do. Um, you've heard uh, earlier on in this meeting, and I'm sure we will continue to, around the significant operational pressures um, that we have um, that we have encountered, uh, and our challenges on kind of stepping back up productive use of our of, of our theatres, um, and in particular um, that kind of flow and impact on elective capacity. So um, we so so I can explain the vast majority of that variance as being not earning that money that we had assumed we had earned. Clearly the operational context that we're operating in is somewhat different to that that we had been asked to plan in. We'll we'll pick that up when um, in the kind of planning item further on in the agenda. The other thing that I think the board needs to be cited on is that recently, i.e. last week, um, we were asked um, uh, as an NHS to reinstitute um, agency caps i.e. Um, there is an expectation that our spend on agency staffing will reduce compared to last year, somewhere between um, minus 10% and minus 30%. 
Um, that will be a significant challenge for us, not least because of the challenges that we've got around um, uh, COVID and ongoing operational issues, but also we have some quite um, specific areas, in particular ED, um, where they are highly reliant, um, more so than other organisations, on, on kind of agency, agency staff. Um, we are higher uh, to month three. We have a higher level of spend to month three than we had last year. So we are higher than last year and therefore um, not anywhere close towards that target. Um, we've spent a lot of time working with um, Deb um, and Fiona at KGH in terms of coming up with an evidence-based um, staffing model for ward nursing um, that you would expect as we kind of move out of the kind of pandemic peak. Um, I'm expecting that to come to board uh, at the next meeting, um, but that will give us a far better start point to be able to manage um, rosters than we have now. Not to say that where we are is ineffective, but it gives us a further level of review, scrutiny um, uh, and support um, for our ward managers to ensure that they're operating with the right levels of staffing from a planning point of view. Um, uh, there was also an item uh, picked up uh, both at the June meeting and July around the state's compliance and the public sector decarbonisation scheme, which um, we'll have a conversation uh, about, no doubt, at private board. Thanks, John. Um, Palmer, anything you need to add? Uh, no, I've got a few slides which covers all my points anyway coming up. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, so moving on to people, which Elaine is kindly covering for Denise, um, and then I'll bring Mark in. Uh, thank you, uh, Heidi. The first uh, thing I would like to, to report to the board that during last two committee meetings, we dedicated substantial time for the board assurance framework and the scrutiny of the allocated risk failed to deliver the group people plan. I'm pleased to report the high level of engagement from executive and non-executive colleagues that generated a productive discussion about control and assurances. We agreed actions which should lead to strengthening the assurance system. And I really would like to use this opportunity to emphasize the importance for every committee to dedicate sufficient resources in shaping the oversight of the harmonized above system. Uh, this will help group to unlock the value which both has. A few words about the performance. Um, good performance in mandatory training. It is above 25% target. Appraisals are below 85% target, but improving. Targets consistently not met, unfortunately, in sickness absences and vacancy rate is shooting to 12% during last two reporting months versus 9% target. Turnover rate is consistently below target of 10%, but this target is way above pre-pandemic level. And of course, that's what um, affects uh, our uh, financial position. And we need really to have a sharp focus on, on the retention. Uh, and as uh, uh, John has already alluded, the agency spend controls have been reintroduced. Uh, we, which is uh, very important for our sustainability. Um, relation and the relationship with uh, ICB become especially important in driving people agenda. There are four committee plans to invite chair of Northamptonshire People Board on quarterly basis. Um, the next point from my uh, side that the trust is working through the implication of the public sector pay award and the government removal of contractual COVID sick pay arrangements. And we also addressed our um, um, work plan and revisited the meeting schedule. Um, Mark, do you want to add anything? Oh, not really, Elaine, you've covered everything. Thank you so much. I think there's just two really, really quick points. I think one of the other points in the report is around the um, impact of transformation, of group transformation specifically, and, that, and that's having um, and causing uncertainty for colleagues, predominantly at the moment in corporate areas where some of that change is occurring. I think that also results in the question that we've got later in, in terms of a question from the public and just in terms of 
um, the uncertainty around jobs and roles and redundancies, et cetera, given the cost of living position. So the only thing I would just confirm, and I'll confirm it later, is it's not our intention to make any compulsory redundancies. Um, that's really important to state. And the second item I would just pick up, which is just around the cost of living again, we talked about this in quite a lot of depth at the committee and in other forums in both hospitals, particularly here, is with regards to um, the implementation of a bring forward salary scheme, uh, which is now fully implemented across the organisation and is being utilised, which again just helps people to release some of their salary earlier than payday for any of those unexpected items that they may need to um, pay for. But that's all, thank you very much. Thanks, Elena and Mark. And just to, from my perspective, just to add, um, we are operationally bringing in a significant level of grip around bringing finance and um, recruitment and operations together on um, keeping a really tight grip on vacancies and agency spend um, reporting into SLT and HMT. Um, and also to note Mark's point, we are doing work in, in relation to the cost of living crisis, but we will continue to think what else we need to do um, because of the, the impact we are seeing. Um, so move on to digital. So um, bring yourself in, David, and then Dan. David, you're on mute. It's a pound in the box, isn't it? Um, yeah, the Group Digital Hospital Committee generally meets every two months. However, an additional extraordinary meeting was convened in June, uh, in addition to the July meeting, uh, given the number of issues that were required to be uh, to be scrutinised. And the June meeting, as the board can probably imagine, was spent or a significant amount of time was spent reviewing the proposals for the implementation of the electronic patient record. Uh, which, of course, the committee wholeheartedly supports. And as I've just said, this uh, this was approved by the um, by FPC yesterday and uh, will be discussed by the board later today. Um, the June meeting also reviewed a number of other capital allocation issues against a number of key projects, including uh, the TIF investment against outpatients and the end user device rollout. Um, the committee also received a paper on an investment proposal for health intelligence, which uh, which I think will be coming to the board at a later date. Um, the July committee, um, the July committee received an update on the group digital strategy um, and the group digital strategy, as the board will recall, uh, had been launched at the start of 2021 uh, and has been subject to regular semi-annual reviews. While the aspiration remains to be the most digital hospital group in England, the target for this uh, to achieve this by 2023 is no longer realistic. The committee, um, the committee discussed uh, for a number of reasons, a number of reasons that are out of our control, um, but include, for example, the somewhat delayed implementation of a standard EPR across the group. So. Uh, so, so, so that date can't be achieved, uh, and I don't believe we've set another date as yet to become the most digital hospital group in England. Um, as is its practice, the committee received updates on the eight digital strategy themes, and it's worth, I think, the board uh, noting a couple of highlights. Um, the first one was in the projects which I've talked about, which are reliant on additional capital to ensure full implementation and realisation of benefits. And some of the additional capital for these projects, for example, TIF, has already been approved. Uh, it's worth noting that volunteers had received training to support um, the basic digital technology and wards, very important, and this was very important during COVID, of course. And um, additionally, the rollout of EDMS, that's the Electronic Document Management System in NGH, is, is going to plan, and Dan might want to add something about that. Uh, clinicians are steadily embracing this, and we are monitoring the rollout very, very carefully. Uh, I have to say that concern was expressed at the committee about the continuing delays in the rollout of the Northampton healthcare record. Um, however, once again, the uh, the committee was given reassurance that um, there was light at the end of the tunnel. The length of the tunnel wasn't actually defined, but um, that should be coming out at some stage before the end of the year. Uh, and finally, importantly, the committee received a report from the uh, the chief clinical information officer, um, and this addressed the need for investment in clinical engagement in implementation of clinic and si clinical systems, and especially the electronic um, patient record. The view was that 2.4 doctors should be deployed for every 1,000 clinical users, and 
you know, th th this is quite practical and realistic. The committee fully endorsed the need for clinical investment, you know, although we were mindful that there would be funding constraints, obviously, but it did emphasize the need to align clinical and digital strategies. Uh, I think that was the conclusion um, for that particular presentation, which we got. Two final items, the, uh, the committee requested an in-depth review into digital staffing issues. Uh, recruitment and, and retention are serious issues. And if anyone knows about the IT competitive environment, then they would fully understand the problems that, uh, that digital are having. Um, finally, the committee endorsed the proposed changes to the BAF, which uh, would have been mentioned previously by, uh, by other presenters. So that's the, uh, the update from the Group Digital Hospital Committee. Thanks, David. Dan, Dan, Dan yeah, sorry. Dan, sorry, David. No, I was going to say the same as you. Dan, have you got anything to add? Excuse me. Thank you. Yes. So I'd just like to kind of point, point out kind of ED, EDMS is a live, 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 live in four, four of eight areas now. So we're kind of working, working to plan on that. So kind of digi digi digitized records, so the progress is going really, really well. And I also wanted to mention that sort of GTHC looked at harmonizing digital risk kind of throughout the kind of group group too. So quite a quite a bit of, a bit of work has been been done in kind of recent weeks on kind of harmonizing risk. So just a couple of additional points. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And just to also add from a chief exec perspective and working with Becky and Andy and Dan and Tom, we're really making sure we're aligning and giving sufficient focus around how transformation is aligning with the digital transformation um, and that we're taking into account the relevant risks. So um, Debbie and myself are, are quite close to some of this in, in the last week or so, so that we can um, really work together to make sure everything's aligned. Um, moving on to CPC, if we can bring David back in. Yep, it's me again. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually de de deputising for Rachel in presenting these summaries. The board can see summaries for the two meetings, June and July there. Um, yeah, I'll take them as read, but just highlight the major agenda items. In the June uh, meeting, the committee received an update from the group CFO, from John, and the completion of the system operating plan. Uh, it was finalized after a number of uh, submissions, apparently. And But the fact that all partners of the system have signed off on the plan really is to be welcomed and presumed it's the first one of many. Um, we received an update in the nursing midwifery and allied health professional strategy, which has which is called Ignite Our Voice. Uh, this was delivered by the chief nurse. The update focused on the five priorities linking to the group values and included an overview of key metrics. And finally, the group director of operational estates provided an update in the group priorities for sustainability. And a key point I think for noting here is the success we had in our 20.6 million bid for funding from the public sector decarbonization scheme, very snappy name. Um, and this will be put towards a number of uh, infrastructure projects aimed at reducing the trust's environmental impact. Uh, and a business case is uh, ongoing or is going through the approval process. The July meeting centered around the Cardiology Center of Excellence, um, the strategy against that, which aims at ensuring that there is equity of access for patients across the county. Um, the committee confirmed its commitment to this strategy, although acknowledging that there was still work to be done in this space. Uh, a report was received on theatre productivity. Uh, I don't think I'm going to say more about that because I think we're going to hear from Palmer later on about this in this meeting. Uh, and finally, the Director of Integrated Governance provided an overview of revised terms of reference for the committee, which will be renamed the Dedicated to Excellence Deliverable Delivery Committee, uh, reflecting focus on the delivery of the group's strategy uh, and including bringing transformation into the committee's brief. So that's the um, that's the summary of the CPC, Heidi. Thanks, David. Um, Becky, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, I don't think so. No, um, uh, it was a good meeting, and um, looking forward to bringing uh, transformation much more into the committee in future. Thanks, Becky. Um, so moving on to audit committee, bringing David back in. <laughs> yeah, it's a great thing being retired, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, Heidi. Uh, I, the committee met on uh, on June the twentieth, um, and as always, of the in the June meeting of the audit committee, the focus was really around the external auditors, 
uh, who are Grant Thornton and their review of the prior year's um, financial statements. Uh, however, other work done by the committee included the usual reports, um, uh, the usual reports from TIAA, who are the trust's internal auditors, um, and this included approving the annual report for 21-22. Also received a report on the work being undertaken in 22-23. I think importantly to mention to the board also is the counter fraud report was received. Um, this is an important area, and the the need was emphasised for continued training and awareness in this space in order uh, basically to be aware of potential threats and to ensure protection of the trust's assets. Um, as the board may recall from my last report. Uh, to the committee. Uh, uh, there has been concern about attention being given to addressal of priority one and priority two audit findings uh, and has finally been agreed that these recommendations will now become agenda items in the board committees to which they pertain and the director of governance is in the process of, uh, of rolling this out to the committees. Moving on to matters relating to the external audit, uh, audits and annual reports, the committee received and approved the trust letter of representation to external auditors. It further received Grant Thornton's audit findings relating to the financial statements for 21-22. Uh, the committee noted um, an unqualified audit bid opinion and also expressed thanks to Grant Thornton for their work and the fact that the audit process this year was uh, was far improved than the audit process that we uh, we had last year. Uh, hence the annual accounts were also approved formally. Um, Grant Thornton noted that per regulatory um, guidance the value for money report would not be finalised until the end of the current month. Uh, the value for money report for, for the board's information covers arrangements the trust has for improving economy efficiency and effectiveness as well as governance and financial sustainability uh, and finally um, the committee received a paper another paper from the director of governance detailing work uh, to refresh and align risk management processes and systems across the group uh, and the committee endorsed this approach including design principles uh, and the process for alignment of the board assurance frameworks so that's me, Heidi. Thanks, David. Um, anything, John, you want to add? And only to say that, um, and I think this rarely happens, um, our external auditors said that we had a good set of accounts and the process was significantly improved on last year. That hasn't gone without significant effort within the team um, to both act on recommendations made last year um, and probably work more transparently and collaboratively with our external auditors. So just a, a, a wider thanks both to our external auditors and to the to, to the wider team that have supported that happening. I think that leaves us in a better place as we work through the year. Thanks, John. Thanks to you and, and Bola for your leadership in that. But as you say, thanks to everybody who's been involved. Um, so moving on to Group Strategic Development Committee, um, bring yourself in, Alan. Thanks very much. You can see the report. There's only one item relevant to NGH. It's already been mentioned, which is the carbonisation programme. And it's clear from that report that we'll be passing that to performance and finance and quality and safety to understand the risk. That's it, Heidi. Thanks, Alan. Stuart, anything you want to add? No, nothing more. Just that we're all very excited in the States about the uh, £20 million fund we have secured and will help us with our move to net zero. Thank you. Um, conscious I didn't take questions throughout, conscious of time, is there any questions um, that won't be addressed through the agenda items? No. no excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much, Heidi. Coffee time, back at 11.10, please. We're slightly behind schedule, as you can see, so back at 11.10, please.
All right, everybody, 11.10, should be coming back on. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, operational plan submission, John, Karen, um, starting with John. Over you go, please, on you go, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, Karen's going to give a brief overview, and I will give a little bit of closing context, if that's okay. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chair. So the paper presented today is the final summary of the um, system plan that's been presented. We've had um, a number of discussions at um, board committees and also separate workshops around the plan. So um, colleagues have been had an opportunity to review in detail the, the detail of the, well, the detail of the plan. Just to, to note, um, I'll take the papers read, I will just draw out a couple of key points. Um, the key point is, as we've discussed previously, this is a system operational plan. The original plan was submitted on the 28th of um, April and um, all systems were asked to resubmit by the 20th of June. So this paper includes the overall summary of what was submitted on the 20th of June. Um, the key points are around delivery of um, our elective recovery and our elective performance. And we've heard today from our theatre teams and we'll hear further around um, delivery against plan, the context within which our teams are working in terms of delivering this plan. But the plan set across the system was set to achieve the elective recovery fund and delivery of the 104% of the 1920 baseline. Um, the main change, uh, the plan also delivers the operational performance targets and focuses on ambulance handovers. Again, those will be picked up later. The main change from the 28th of April submission is around the financial break-even position. So all plans um, were asked to, all systems were asked to consider the risks to deliver break-even and our plan that we've worked across the system and there's been some, and John can talk a bit more about this, but some significant movement around the financial positions within the system to enable us to deliver a, or submit a break-even plan. This does come with considerable risk and that um, has been included and we will um, we'll be working across the system around um, uh, identifying further how we mitigate those risks and what those risks are. I think the other key note to make is that this plan is delivering for 22, 23, and it's not around the longer term. And we recognise there's some significant work to be done around achieving a longer term financial sustainability. Um, so I think there are the key points I wanted to make. John, did you want to come back in on any of that in terms of um, moving forward with the plan? Uh, I, th I think the I think the important things that for the board to be cited on are that you know we've we've we pulled together a plan with a set of quite core assumptions and some of those assumptions are already um, uh, being ex challenged quite significantly so we were asked to plan for a situation with low to no COVID that's clearly not where we are at this point we were asked to plan for a scenario where operational disruption was minimal both throughout this part of the year and as we move into winter and what we've heard quite clearly and colleagues would have read in the national media that, um, that those challenges are really significant and quite present, not least around um, the impact of, of continued disruption around COVID and our ability to manage beds and flow within the hospital, but also um, the significant challenges that we have around um, discharge um, and stranded stroke significant length of stay for patients that medically fit um, uh, and are unable and are unable to leave the hospital which that which will pick up elsewhere um, on the agenda so the, the the assumptions under which the plan has been derived are already starting to creak is probably the way I would describe it um, we clearly need to work with system colleagues and internally on how we might manage that um, but that is going to be a consistent and continued theme as we work through the challenge for us, I think, is going to be ensuring that we're doing everything we possibly can within that context. Uh, and I'm comfortable given where we are with our productivity and change programs um, and the kind of relentless focus on ensuring that we have flow and um, are, are not stepping down or closing elective capacity unnecessarily. That, that we have those building blocks in place, um, we clearly need to be able to articulate and evidence that. So that 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 is going to be very challenging. Um, we continue um, to um, provide support and are being asked for increasing support around mutual aid. This is where other systems um, that are struggling with their waiting lists, most of which are significantly higher than ours for long for long waiters, um, that we are being requested to provide support with our own capacity. 
clearly that creates challenges in terms of logistics and managing patients on lists, um, but also in terms of our ability to do our own our own activity. And again, that is going to be something that is going to be a feature, not just in this year, but as we move forward. So the operational context is extremely challenging on the money, as you've already referred to, Karen. Um, we have had a not insignificant increase in the challenge for us when we closed out our final plan. Um, it requires us to improve this year's financial performance by some £9.2 million pounds, um, compared to the uh, a previous iteration of a plan. That is extremely challenging, um, again, and will only, will only happen if stroke when the context allows us uh, to use our capacity as effectively and as efficiently and productively as we feel we are able to. So absolute positives in terms of system conversation, system joined up in terms of understanding and buying into risk. Um, you've already heard this morning um, a number of um, programs where we are working collaboratively with system partners around discharge. Those programs are, are, are still to be developed, stroke implemented, um, and uh, we need to continue to work collaboratively, as I believe we have done in developing the plan, um, and we will continue to do to get to the best position for NGH and for the system. Okay, thank you very much. We've been through this a few times. This is iteration number whatever, four or five. Um, any comments or questions on this? No, not seeing any. Okay. Well, we are, uh, sorry, Heidi. Um, it was just to acknowledge um, the hard work on this, but also to say where um, Debbie and myself, Debbie from KGH, we are making sure as a group, we're working really closely to understand if we go off plan or why we're going off plan. So we've got a really significant level of grip to be able to assure the board on the narrative around and meeting our initial efficiencies, but also any shift, whether that's mutual aid or um, the impact of COVID. So we're all working really closely to make sure we can explain that narrative so that we've got the right level of grip over this. Okay, Elena. Um, thank you, Alan. Uh, it's great, Heidi, that you work very close with um, Kettering uh, Hospital Chief Exec. Uh, my, my question, how are other hospitals, other trusts in Midlands are performing against 104% um, target? Okay, you can answer that, Palmer. Uh, yeah, quite simply, not as good as us. Um, uh, and I'll come on to this on my points, but the 104 weekers we have are all patients from outside of our area. Wait, so let's pick um, it up in, in, in yeah. the next section where you're talking about the operational focus. A good question, though, Elena. Okay. Um, we're, 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 are you going to talk about something else, Palmer? No, your hand was still yes. up. Sorry. Um, okay. It depends how comfortable we are with uncertainty of this stuff, really. Um, and we occasionally talk about that. Clearly, there is constrained national political leadership until the 5th or 6th of September. And, and that makes some of the discussions nationally rather difficult. Um, and clearly, when you do a plan, uh, you're told what assumptions to make around inflation, around COVID, around whatever else. And we did that. And some of those things will come to pass. And some of those things have not come to pass. So we continue to do the best we can against the backdrop of what we said we would do, recognizing that those plans uh, are based in some cases on a, a different foundation than was hoped for. Um, obviously, um, we're talking about planning and money here, but in the end of the day, we're talking about patients and trying to clear backlogs and trying to get patients who've had surgery either waiting here in Northamptonshire or waiting in Leicester mostly, but other places as well to try and help them to clear their backlogs. And that is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Patients arrive, they're not quite sure what the operation they want, they're not quite worked up, ready for it. They, we need to start again. It's just a very difficult process. So we continue to do the best we can. We need to, um, through performance and finance and through other areas, make sure we reset the, the dials frequently on this. But the trick is to keep doing the best we can against a changing and uncertain um, position. I'm sure the political leadership nationally, um, looking at the papers today and the Confedera NHS Confederation survey that talks about the crisis can only be addressed by improving pay and social care. 
those things will all be considered through September, October as, as national political leadership changes and uh, re-engages. So we are where we are. We will continue to do the best we can. Right. Thank you very much. Operational focus. Well, Pamela, this is your, your bit of the show. This is the bit that really matters in many ways. What are we doing operationally within the hospital? Over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to share my screen so hopefully you can see the slides because they do help me talk through the narrative. Has that worked? Yes, it is. Yeah, brilliant. So um, what I'm going to do is just take you through um, four aspects of this. So ambulance handover pathways and discharge which is the first two slides. So I'll go through that and then pause for questions. The second and third parts really run together, elective cancer and then obviously against the elective recovery, recovery activity and plan. Then have a handover to um, HEMAP for a mortality update. Um, as you can see from this, and I've talked about before, ambulance to handover delays are the ultimate symptom of a wider cause. And you can see here we've done a lot of work, and I've talked to all the committees about it, in trying to ensure that we are decreasing the amount of weight in, in A&E and therefore able to offload. We made huge uh, gains in May. Similar gains in June, however, it has come undone in July, and I'll walk, walk aboard through this now. Um, we are seeing over 110% of our activity from 1920 coming through the front door. And in reality, that masks a little bit of it as well, because we have people who turn up to A&E and they are streamed directly into our same day emergency care, which we have talked about for one of the best in the country. We are really good at it in terms of the percentage we send there. But they don't, they don't then book in at A&E, they book in there. So when we're talking about urgent care activity, we can add that on. We can also add on the fact that our ambulances do actually go straight to our same day emergency care. So also we are able to offload straight there, they don't touch A&E. So when you look at our entire emergency care and urgent care footprint, we have increased it by well over 110%. But the raw numbers appearing in A&E are 110%. Um, if you couple that with uh, some of, the, when you look at the 95th percentile of those peaks, we are also seeing a new record set. So pre-COVID, 350 to 400 might be a really bad day. Definitely wouldn't go with 400. Now we're seeing 400 regularly, with 506 now being uh, the new record, which is a couple of weeks ago on a Monday of all days, which is usually our worst day. And I have to admit, everyone dealt with it very well. Add on to this the amount of pathway delays, which I'll go into more details in a minute. We are seeing a really um, stressful time and a lot of pressure on the front door and um, the hospital. I've got to say we've done an enormous amount of work on Pathway Zero and if someone had given me these metrics six months into my tenure I'd have bitten their hand off to say that we've done this well and teams have worked incredibly hard. So this bottom graph here starts to show you where the problems are rising. This, the purple line is our, the length of stay for everyone who's discharged on that given day. So you can see here, an enormous amount of work to reduce the length of stay for everyone leaving the hospital has gone from 10, sorry, 10 down to seven days. However, the green line is our current inpatient length of stay on that same day. So you can see all those staying is growing and growing and growing from 15 to 20 days. And we've offset this by dropping it down to seven. And actually you can see at the beginning of July, it's come back up again because we are running with less and less beds. Why does it particularly matter and how do we know we're any good? Simon sent me the challenge a couple of weeks ago to just to prove that we are good internally. Uh, and the way we've looked at this is the model hospital. So it gives us a portal to benchmark us nationally. Um, and when you look at it, to be in the top half of hospitals, you have to have a length of stay of 9.4 days, to be in the top quartile, 8.1 days. And we have 606 beds across uh, the adult um, aspects of um, of NGH, there are another 100 odd beds, which are largely down to maternity, paediatrics, and other areas. We've discounted those for this calculation, as does model hospital, so it is fair. You can also discount 88 elective beds and ITU, so we have 518 adult emergency beds we can use on any given day. Now, out of those, if we were to look at our 42 discharges per day from when we arrive, arrive back in February, that will give us a, a length of stay of 12.3 days. We've improved to the amount of people we discharge on a daily basis to 46. And in fact, over the last three weeks, it's been 49. But that brings you down to 11.3 days, but still in the worst half of the country. However, when you start to look at the fact that we have 130 people every single morning at the moment who are medically fit for discharge, waiting on pathways one, two or three, we are left with 374 beds. 
that gives you a length of stay of 8.1 days, which puts you bang on the top quartile in the country. If you also add on this little cohort here, so these are our, we call them P0, so pathway zero to be confirmed. The issue is we have a lot of people who are not pathway zero, so they're not going to go home, but they've not yet been accepted onto a pathway. So they're somewhere in limbo land. And so we work with IT and we have this separate category we call P0 to be confirmed, and that is 50 people on there at the moment. Um, the numbers within there vary, but it's this morning it is 201 people total across all those categories. So we're left with 324 beds. That gives us a length of stay of 7.04 days. And actually over the last week, we have achieved over 50 discharges per day. And we've had to do that because the amount of pressure has come out on the system. Um, what helped us back in April and May was, us, was the COVID numbers reducing, and therefore we could then make uh, use of our beds and our P0 discharges. And that's why the performance starts to increase. However, we're now experiencing another wave of COVID with 70 to 90 patients in our beds. We're seeing the same amount of people moving wards we've talked about before, on top of the near doubling, if not tripling of numbers waiting for out of that door. And we could deal with one or the other. We can't deal with both. At the moment, we have both. So last week on the critical incident, we went into Compton Ward, which is our elective trauma and orthopedic ward. We've got into the heart center and we've gone into the, our, our day case uh, surgery recovery areas. And we're still in there today. So we, we are in a very, very good position this morning. We are safe. We're now just trying to recover where we were electively. Um, and the reason the critical care, the critical incident was called last week is because it was unsafe. We had people on ambulances for five hours. And it should be pointed out at this point that regionally, we have been commended by the team for the care we do give to those, even though they are waiting. For those who've been out to any, I think everyone has, you can't really offload and cohort our ambulances. And so actually you end up caring for them back in ambulances and they have been commending us for the quality and safety we give to those patients, despite the fact they haven't handed over yet. So our teams are still going out there, treating patients and making sure that if it was one of our loved ones, they would still get the care they need, despite not being in the department yet, which is really where we're at. Um, in terms of what we're doing on Pathway Zero, uh, we've got our flow coordinators are now fully up and running. The diagnostics have doubled the amount of inpatient scans they do on a daily basis. So CT, and MRI have doubled, which is an incredible feat. And I'll come on to the risks that come with that in the elective slides shortly. Our IV antibiotic trial is now in phase two, so they're rolling out from the trial wards to the rest of medicine. Frailty unit is now up and running, discharging regularly. CND Emergency Care has been presenting at national conferences, they're so good. And our ED continues to achieve a lower uh, admission rate uh, than where we were at the beginning of the year. So where I'm getting out of this for the board is the assurance piece on we are doing everything we can. We are keeping everyone safe in A&E. We are making sure that we are discharging an ever increasing amount, uh, despite us having an ever decreasing amount of beds to play with. That's uh, the quickest run through I could possibly try and give uh, on a, the non-elective side. I don't know whether to pause there, Chair, for uh, any questions. Okay, any questions at all? Um, let me just have a quick look and see how I can see that. Um, anybody at all? Um, David. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Palmer, for, um, you know, I mean, the rigour and discipline you put into this analysis is absolutely brilliant. So thank you for that. But uh, it, it's very interesting that we, we have record attendances of 506 patients, yeah, which is significantly above anything we've had before. Um, and, and the trend presumably is, is going up in terms of people turning up at the door at A&E or ambulances turning up. My question is why? <laughs> why is this happening? Um, is there a specific reason that more, that more people in Northamptonshire are, are getting so ill they have to turn up to A&E? Is, is this something we understand? Um, or is it something we're still trying to get to grips with? And I think associated with that particular point is something which I think Heidi mentioned in her in her summary, which is concerning the fact that we don't have an urgent care centre in the south of the county. And there is one, I believe, in the north of the county. Um, what is being done to um, to change that? Are there plans to put up a, uh, a an urgent care centre somewhere, a toaster or Brackley or whatever? Anybody else want to pick up anything before we get some some responses to that? I'm not seeing anything. No. 
Okay, Palmer, we can pick up on those two points. Yeah, thanks, David. So it's interesting when you look at the 506 people through a day, it's the same level of admission rate as a normal day. So what we can take from that is actually the number of people coming through is a normal day. We are just seeing more people now accessing healthcare, whether that's because of the population, and we're just waiting for the census data later on this year to see where we're at um, across the board. But we, we are seeing, you know, if anything, we've changed our admission rates from the beginning of the year, but that's largely due to, due to the pathways that are open and the knowledge of the, from the team in A&E, not because of the number of the, different, the type of patients coming through. So I, I think it is an increase in population and something we're going to have to deal with long term. Um, and Heidi touched on this morning, our GERFT review showed we are eight cubicles short in our A&E. So there is something to do there. However, we have a very good A&E team, extremely good, actually. And the way I know that is when you look at our non-admitted performance in A&E, so those that are discharged from A&E, on average, they stay less than four hours, despite the fact we are continually overcrowded. So if you come in and you need to go home, you are seen within four hours. It's those that are admitted that are taking a longer period of time because they're waiting on beds and they are cared for. So we do have a very good team here. Can they do better? Can we do better? Absolutely. And we will continue to do so. It's just, a, you know, it's that assurance piece that we are doing well. In terms of the urgent treatment centre, absolutely, yeah, we would benefit from it here. There is a case in, uh, Simon is on the case, I know, regularly, and we have probably working with the system in terms of trying to support something for the next 12 to 18 months and installing a location, location to be confirmed, unfortunately. Elena. Um, thank you, Alan, and uh, really congratulations with the huge work and the discharges within the beds available are really impressive. Um, my, my question is, um, because the healthcare system is, uh, is really struggling with so-called high, intense, high intensive um, users, basically uh, the users which are coming to our any &E doors again and again, um, usually for the wrong reasons, but they cost us a lot of resources. Um, what analysis do we do and how do we tackle these uh, high intensity users? You're absolutely right. I think some of the work that's been done across ICANN, uh, we have a front door, new front door dashboard that starts to show exactly that. Who are our frequent, frequent flyers, frequent um, users of the service? Why they're coming in? And then there are um, forums we go to with the system, whether that be police, social care, everything else, to try and look at how we can support these people around the community. Because we do have people who regularly come in, regularly by ambulance, and yet their admission rate is, only, is below 10%. Uh, you know of their visits so you're, you're you're spot on but we are we have a very good system that's starting to get up and running that dashboard is getting better and better unfortunately it's still being sent to us as pds it's not a live one we can play with yet but it's a step forward in the right direction okay thank you uh heidi um it was just to also add elena the work i was referring to to where high usage of care homes where we get more either readmissions or admissions from care homes that's the work i was referring to in my report we still need to do more work there to work with care homes um and understand the frequent attendances by gp for it for example so that we can work with them on certain pathways which Hemant is keen to do from a clinical perspective so still more we can do there but there is work happening Thank you. If we're going to win arguments and integrate the care board about where the priorities ought to be and what the changes ought to be either in GP services, primary care, or police, uh, or various other things, or any outreach services, um, then we're going to have to build that on good data. So this is a good data report and, and that's the kind of thing it needs. Far too often we end up in boards speculating um, and uh, it's not a good place to be. And even if you like what you speculate about, it doesn't mean you can convince anybody else. So data is crucial important. So well done, uh, Palmer. It's a good report. Um, and it does point to some areas that uh, more focus is required on. But clearly, your basic proposition that you still admit 17% or whatever it is from 500 people as opposed to 350 people means they're not coming with trivia. They're coming with their normal case mix coming through the door. Um, and uh, we can talk about the census, we can talk about the increase in over 65s, over 85s, over whatever, uh, we can look at all of that and I think we just need to continue to do that. And we need to give you resources to help you to do that analytic work. Please note IT. 
Um, thank you very much. Um, are you passing on to him now? Um, no, no, so just, just the elective and cancer and the okay. RF. So uh, the information on the slides, but just as a, a, a quick update, our two week waits, we continue to treat people 54% uh, of them treated in seven days. Uh, despite the fact we're seeing over 20% every single month increase from pre-COVID within that month. So you, you can see on the slide, 1,721 received in May, and it's not far off that for June as well. Um, however, we have achieved the target in May. We did slip just below it in June. Um, that's mainly because of patient choice as we started to go into holiday season. Um, but we did maintain, uh, despite being a lower performance, we are second in the region uh, on that side. Our 28-day faster diagnosis, uh, we continue to be above the target. We continue to be highly ranked in the region, so second. And lastly, the ultimate one, which is 62 days, when are people treated? Now, we have quite a low performance of 64% on the slides. 58% was last month. Um, maintained our position as second in the region. However, what's important of this is how many people are waiting over 62 days, because you could not treat them and have a higher performance, because it takes... It only looks as at a percentage of who you treat, not who is on your PTL. We continue to treat those people over 62 days, hence the low performance. But when you look at our size of our PTL over 62 days, we are actually second in the country as a, as a system, and with only 5.7% of our patients waiting over 62 days. So when you look at the overall cancer pathway here, we are in an exceptionally good position. Um, and I think that's a really strong, and that's testament to what the theatres team uh, this morning, uh, and the theatres team we have here with Carl, uh, and obviously Haman driving it medically is incredibly important. And it all, we are, we've been recognised quite well across the new robotic pathways. We are now starting to give uh, mutual aid to Coventry uh, for our urology patients, which is a really good uh, regionally uh, for our position. It's good for obviously our surgeons and our position, but it just puts us on a different um, position there. We of course have to look at how that affects our demand and capacity, because on the elective side, you'll see that whilst our trajectory is zero for 104 weekers, we do have 23, uh, most of them in ENT and one urology, and all of them are from University Hospitals Leicester, um, and they've been transferred down because they've been long waiters. We wanted to get, and the national drive was to reduce them to zero before the end of July, however, some of these are complex and some of these are obviously some patient choice issues be coming into the summer. So they will be tripping into further months as we go forward. As a result also, we've taken on 92 patients from uh, University Hospitals Leicester at the moment, uh, Kettering I think around 35. Uh, and as a result of taking so many for us, it does have an impact on those patients on our PTL. So we would have a trajectory of having 10 people waiting over a year, whereas we have 130 now as a result of pushing so many across and trying to treat them in time. Um, most of those sit in TNO, gynae and ENT. And unfortunately, obviously the TNO problem now with everyone in, with our non-elective position uh, taking over Compton, that means we can't get a lot of our trauma orthopedic uh, elective operating done, um, despite them being uh, ready to go. So we are hoping to be back in there by Monday and that'll be back up and running. And I think the forecast is now on for November to fully reduce the number down to zero. On the elective recovery side, uh, we had 97%, this is important here where we're looking, we were aiming for 104, our plan was to hit 102% uh, of 1920 activity. So when we're talking percentages here, it's the percentage that 100% of our activity would be 102 against the 1920 plan. So our Elective uh, plan, we hit 97%, which I must say I am pleased about. Um, I would love to be over 100%, but I'm, when I say I'm pleased, I think it's considering all the challenges that have been presented to the teams. We regularly have at least a list being cancelled a day due to sickness uh, and illness. And you can see on the following presentation, our um, utilisation in June has dropped considerably because of the knock-on effect of COVID uh, vacancies. Our day case, however, is 101%. So they are achieving well over 105% in reality. Uh, and there are 112 patients over what they should be, they said they were going to do. And they continue to work incredibly hard. And most of the team that spoke to you this morning were from day case theatres. On the outpatient side, 97% for first appointments and 100% for follow-ups. Now, we want to be below 100% for follow-ups because nationally we want to be driving down the amount we do. We don't want to be over 100. Unfortunately, because of all the really good work being done on the follow-up, um, 
patients unbooked. We've validated over 100,000 patients so far since the start of our project. And actually everyone on there at the moment does need to come in and be seen. So over time, we'll be trying to push them towards um, uh, using the uh, patient initiated follow-up, which will reduce that amount. And lastly, I think the biggest risk I'd like to highlight to the board is the diagnostic. It says 94% of activity here. That is because we've put so much into our non-elective pathways. If you remember, I talked about the doubling of CT and MR capacity. It's done the right thing there. It's the right thing for patients. However, it does have an impact. So our MR weights for cancer are, are over two and a half weeks now, and our CT is not far off that. And the plan is to get a another mobile um, or kind of semi-mobile, it's much better than a mobile, uh, MRI scanner in. That will increase our activity whilst also being able to bring down the waiting time. It will also free up our staff from doing extra MRI so they can flip across to more CT, bringing that down. And also the PET CT scanner we have on, on site will be doing more CT sessions outside of their hours to try and support us. So a lot of those times there are plans to bring these things down. And that's why you'll see 94% here, but we're only 85% against our DMA1 position, which is our Diagnostic Performance National Target. Um, so I think we are in a very, very strong position considering where we were, but unfortunately this is the first time since I've arrived we've gone into elective beds, and I think that's where the risk lies, and that's where we need to try and get back onto an even keel. I think while we continue to have peaks in COVID and peaks, or sustained peak in uh, medically fit for discharge patients waiting in our beds, we might see this happen again in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Comments, questions at all? No. Okay. Continues to be a good bit of data, Palmer. And clearly, <clears throat> you don't lightly go into elective areas to uh, cope with demand, but it was exceptional through the heat wave and a couple of other things. Um, I think to the Community Diagnostic Centre paper, which is coming later, obviously has some impact on that kind of work. And we need to think very carefully about where that is placed and how that works, but definitely increasing the diagnostic capability and um, we know that we're talking in the north about moving clinical and diagnostic services further out into the town centres and so on and I think we need to pursue that quite actively in NGH as well. Um, there are lots of spaces available which would give high access to members of the public but it's a good report and it clearly lays out exactly what the progress is and what the problems are. Um, Hemant. Thanks, Chair. Just wanted to add from the cancer perspective, uh, despite uh, a pressured environment, I'm pleased to note uh, and inform the board that it, our all planned phase one specialities from the robotic assisted surgical uh, 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 services all have completed their training and have been operationalized. And all the patients who have been long waiters from which we have repatriated have been, uh, have been operated on. So it's, it's a good feather in the cap especially for the theatre teams uh, and the clinical teams. Just wanted the board to know. Thank you. Yeah, it, I mean, the whole mutual aid thing, I mean, we are part of the NHS and it is the right thing to do. We don't just look after people who live in Northamptonshire. Um, so it is the right thing to do, but I think we need to continue to show them as best we can separately, recognising what the rules are about how we count them and all the rest of it. But certainly in this kind of paper, understanding what we're dealing with here. But I think the only other thing I'd say is on that, uh, that, you know, the board consistently prioritizes cancer in its concerns. And if one of our non-execs who's not here today was here, she would certainly be going on about the importance of hitting those cancer targets and informing patients and so on. So let's just make sure we continue to focus on that because um, there is no other place for those patients to go. Um, there are some, some options, unpleasant or undesirable or inappropriate or whatever else for some other things, but there are no options for cancer patients. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and the final bit, I presume, is Hemant on shimmies and such like things. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, first, uh, it gives me immense pleasure to present this because uh, comparing ourselves nationally, we are in very good position. Um, uh, just from the point of view of public viewers, I would, I would like to explain what SHIMI and HSMR stands. Uh, so SHIMI is a sum summary hospital level mortality indicator, which includes uh, patients who are in the hospital in 30 days following discharge. And hospital standardized mortality rate, which is HSMR, includes all the patients who die in the hospital. And, and that metric is, is nationally uh, reported by NHS. 
Uh, over the last 18 months, uh, uh, what we have seen is a sustained and incremental improvement uh, in our mortality metrics, uh, which is excellent. Uh, and there have been a lot of factors behind it. The key factor for this has been uh, uh, really uh, the narrowing of the gap between the weekend and the week, uh, uh, weekday mortality, which was identified way back in December 2019. And despite uh, all the COVID pressures uh, uh, over the last 18 months, there have been several initiatives which has helped towards uh, not only uh, uh, reducing, but maintaining our position from above expected to below expected on all three mortality indicators, the HSMR, the shimmy, and the crude mortality. And I would like to bring uh, uh, attention to four really key uh, areas. The first area has been a rigorous analysis uh, into the insights from the medical examiner surveys, from the mortality work streams, from learning from the serious incidents leading to shared learning. The second important has been a trust-wide organizational and structural changes in implementing the medical examiner service with extension into the primary care, dedicated patient safety improvement team uh, with, with employment of specific specialist nurse with VTE, sepsis, acute kidney injury, and, and definitely uh, you know, expansion of the home delivery, uh, home oxygen delivery and the virtual wards. Uh, the, the third improvement has been the clinical improvement initiatives, which ID alluded in a report, and we have been shortlisted for the HSJ, is the IBOX based uh, deteriorating patient work stream, which has been extremely important in, uh, in reducing an, uh, our mortality by early identification and intervention, being proactively uh, and being proactive in treating uh, deteriorating patients. Uh, in addition, there have been a lot of work streams uh, which, which have not been noticed, but which have contributed, which is like end of life care pathway at the front door, the dedicated pharmacy service, which has definitely helped for medication errors, et cetera, which has, which has definitely contributed towards uh, reducing our mortality figures. And the final point uh, uh, is definitely uh, improvement culture, a collaborative joint of working, a multidisciplinary meeting, uh, you know, a VT MDT, a diabetic MDT, this has helped immensely. Having said that, I think there is lots for us to still do uh, for continued improvement and, and the digital improvements with EPMA will help. Secondly uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 yeah, going back to the culture, the dare to share, learning across the county externally uh, as well will help. And, and finally, uh, I think what we really need to push uh, and which we are doing through the new patient safety strategy of making a proactive culture rather than re reactive when it comes to mortality work streams. So I will stop there uh, and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. So good stuff, Hemant. It's a remarkable drop in the shimmy rate and a good analysis of it. Any comments or questions about that? No. Okay. These are real deaths we're talking here. This is not a statistical um, thing. These are real deaths. And um, when they drop, because they shouldn't have happened, broadly speaking, not in an individual way, but against the shimmy and the HSMR data, um, above expected then. You know, a hospital should take action. You can clearly see the trend. You can clearly see the report came. I can remember the report well and what we talked about that was the, that, that shimmy rate uh, back in, in when it was approaching its peak. So this is seriously, seriously good piece of work that makes a genuine difference. It's, as I say, this is not a statistical artifact. This is real stuff. Heidi. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the point you've made, but also to say we're looking at what's contributed to this on a broader sense and looking to where we can rec replicate the systematization of this work into other areas across nursing on some of the harm areas in nursing, which Le Helen talked about earlier. Nearly called you lid better than Helen. Um, uh, so we are really thinking about what's driven this and how can we look at it elsewhere. So working closely with the patient safety team and in how we adapt our governance in light of the patient safety strategy. Yeah, and clearly the weekend working and the deteriorating patient working becomes pretty crucial in that. Jill. Um, thank you, Chair, <clears throat> and thank you, Hamant. Uh, obviously, uh, you, you, the data tells the story for us, which is fantastic and good to hear a flavour of, of what's contributed to it. 
Um, I just wanted to make the point that what could be even better is potentially looking at the um, end of life service across the system, um, which uh, we've been trying to work with system colleagues on. Uh, the front door um, service that Hermant and others have referred to is short term funding from the Macmillan service. And the statistics from that are amazing. So uh, we're working on a business case to make this a substantive service. So hope that's successful. Um, but nonetheless, we still don't have a joined up system across um, across the ICS. So, you know, I look forward to hearing that that potentially will improve as we begin to work better across the ICS. Yes, I agree, Joe. Thank you very much for that. OK. Thank you, guys. A seriously good bit of analytic work and a seriously good bit of explanation of what's going on. Continuing with the, with the Palmer show, um, theatre productivity and the trust care coordination system. Palmer, in this case, working with Becky. You'll be lucky, you, guys. Thank you. I was going to say, don't worry, it's Becky who front this one up. I was going to say, we thought it might be nice to give Palmer a, a short break, although I'm, I'm sure he can contribute. Um, so I, I'm slightly mindful of what time and where we are on the agenda and really keen to show people um, the trust coordination, care coordination system. I've got um, Joe Fernihar from NHS England, who is from the Improving Elective Care Coordination Programme, and also Jack Stevenson, um, who is our lead for the trust care coordination system, um, uh, who we which is a NHSE pilot, and we're really fortunate to be part of it. Um, so I will take most of the paper as read, but I will just share um, on a couple of slides. Um, obviously, we've heard from the theatres team this morning, and I think this is really building on um, what you were saying, Alan, around making sure that the theatre flow and the processes that sit around it. Obviously, there's lots of work that we heard this morning around teamwork and recruitment. This is really focusing on how do we get the right patient into the right place. Um, so small bit of um, context. Um, this is the screen from Model Hospital um, around touch time utilisation. Um, there is a national target for 85% for theatres productivity. Um, Palmer, I think, rightly called this out when we were discussing in, in CPC. Um, there are only nine trusts nationally that are achieving that target. Um, and when you look at where we are within Kettering and Northampton, um, we are sort of hovering in the kind of late late 70s, early 80s. Um, NGH had a really good May, um, but as Palmer says, some difficulties, particularly around increases in COVID absences, have, have resulted in a in a decrease in utilisation during June. Um, and really what the Theatre Productivity Programme is doing is helping to make sure we get the right patients with the right preoperative assessments booked into the right sessions with the right staff and the right skills um, and the right equipment that runs smoothly on the day and supported by the right systems, the right visibility of data. And then obviously we heard a bit this morning around kind of the, the leadership, the right leadership team, that team ethos and that culture within the team. Um, so really the trust care coordination um, program that we're part of the pilot for um, is really helping us. And I, I won't go into detail on all of these, um, but on some of those different sessions, it's really going to help us to support clinical prioritisation and management of the inpatient waiting list. Um, it's going to help us make sure that we have completed pre-ops in place um, so that we've got a pool of patients who've had that pre-operative assessment. Um, it will support the 642 process. And Ruth was talking about those principles this morning. But this is really around making sure that the timetable is locked down six weeks in advance. And we're offering up any sessions where a surgeon or an anaesthetist is unavailable to a different specialty to book into that. Making sure we're booking those patients in by four weeks and then making sure we've got the kind of list order and we've taken into account things like do we need a HDU bed for the, this patient um, at the two week point? Um, and then making sure that we have a single view. So one of the things that's quite challenging for the teams booking theatres at the moment, you've got to look at the annual leave in health roster. You've then got Nexus, which is where the theatres bookings are. You've then got the patient record, which is where that, that sits. And then you've got the waiting list elsewhere. And so you've got people that are trying to make judgments from about four or five different systems all in 
um, all in one place. And um, certainly Gregor was describing to me when, when we were first looking at this, well, in order to get a view looking forwards as to how booked the theatre sessions are, you have, you know, he was describing to me asking a medical secretary to sit down and literally write down what are the sessions and what are the lists that are coming through. So the real benefit of the care coordination system for us is, is creating that single view. Um, so we're part of um, the, the national pilot um, from NHS England, um, and we are extremely uh, grateful for their support um, within this, um, which is both covering um, the system, but also some, some programme support. Um, and it really has these kind of four um, main areas in it. So an overview of the waiting list, um, being able to make it easy for wait list, um, our waitlist coordinators to kind of clean and deal with some of those um, issues of the waiting list, the theatre scheduling, um, and then being able to, to look what, what all of that looks like. Um, so what I will just do is um, a brief demo of um, kind of what the system looks like. Um, so I'll just switch my screen. Um, are people able to see my screen? Yes, super. Um, so this is um, the kind of main area. So you can see up here, and I should just say this is a demo. Um, there is no patient information on here, and this is not NGH data um, because uh, there is patient information within this. So it is a, a demo system. Um, so we've got the uh, theatres utilisation. Um, so we're able to see that. We've got how many bookings they've been. We've got the waiting list size. Um, and then we can see all of the waiting lists. And this is why I say, don't, don't worry too much. This is not our waiting list. And um, we obviously don't have this many patients who are waiting over 52 weeks. Um, and then it provides a view of theatre utilisation across the different specialties. Um, so you can have a look at what that looks like. And compared to the waiting list, you can say, OK, um, perhaps looking at um, uh, let's pick a specialty, uh, looking at endocrinology on this list. Um, there is a lot more theatre time allocated than is booked, and it's got one of the largest waiting lists. Um, so then you could have a look at it and you could say, actually, what I want to understand is how can I book more patients into, um, into my endocrinology lists? Um, so that's the kind of view that you can have um, looking across the whole of the um, section very colourful this screen, um, but it provides us with a nice breakdown of what that waiting list um, by specialty looks like for different gaps. So this would really help with making sure we're planning for dealing with those um, long waiters and, and what that looks like um, if we happen to have a specialty that was particularly high. But the real power in this is it's one system that we can look, look at at a board level um, and it's the same system that people can look at individual patients um, within that. So um, this would be the kind of view that a patient um, waiting list coordinator would look at. Um, so there's the patient list within here and you can um, this pulls from a number of different places. So you can see it's got all the information about the procedures. Um, it's also got the information about the preoperative status of that patient and um, the kind of POA outcome. Um, which is really crucial information that at the moment has to be looked at on um, different systems. Um, it's got whether or not they've got a date to come in um, and it's got information about the RTT pathway. So it provides all that information all in one space. And if you want to see more information, you can click on that and it will give you all of that information um, in a nice, easy format to look at. You can see the timeline of people's um, outpatient appointments. You can see the timeline of when they were booked in. So it makes it much easier to see all of that information you need to know about a patient before you're booking them in. Um, we can also see the theatre sessions. Um, so this is a view of the theatre sessions. Um, this one happens, um, like I say, not real data, but uh, David Howell's um, session. And you can see he's got six patients that are booked in. You can see the key information about that. Uh, and you can see at the top here, this number of patients booked and then how many booked minutes are there and what's the booked utilisation at the top here, um, which really will support the teams to be able to identify. These are the lists that perhaps we could fit another patient into um, and you can filter. So when you're running those meetings six weeks in advance, four weeks in advance, two weeks in advance, um, perhaps you're running it um, specifically for um, uh, one type of specialty, you can filter for the specialty you want at the top. 
um, and you can filter for the week that you're looking at. So if you're looking at three weeks out, um, you can click for three weeks out and it will refresh that. And then that can be run through through the meeting. Um, you can also um, within here, um, you can uh, automatically add in cases to a session. So say we have identified that that Shannon Williamson list could have another patient within that 43 minutes. You can click on add cases um, and you can say, I would like to um, add a case. You can assign it um, to the relevant booking clerk for what that looks like um, and submit that. And that will then create that action and it becomes a, a single place um, that logs all of the different actions in terms of scheduling across all of our multiple um, theatre systems. And then um, because it's got a live feed or, or near live, uh, it updates every 15 minutes from our systems. It means that we can also tell from this action list of booking requests that have been actioned, we can tell when they've been actioned in the system. Um, so we've got that audit trail of this is who is booked into that session. And, and this is um, this is the action that was taken. And, and this is what it looks like. Um, so I will um, stop there in terms of a brief um, demo of what that looks like um, and just finish with where we are in terms of the rollout. So we now have all of our theatres data um, within the tool. Um, we're just finalising bringing in the annual leave data so that we can automatically flag sessions where staff are on leave, um, which we're just working through over the next um, couple of weeks. Um, and we've done um, training sessions with three pilot specialties within NGH um, to get them more familiar with looking at the tool and, and how will we use it practically within our 642 meetings and our waiting list validation. Um, and we will be aiming... Um, uh, once we've got that annual leave data in, which is pretty critical for supporting 642, we'll be rolling that out through our surgical specialties, aiming for the end of um, September in terms of making making sure that we're able to start incorporating this and make sure that, um, you know, as we were hearing this morning, making sure that we've got the right patients booked into the right lists and we're not making last minute changes to list orders. Um, so I'll I'll bring Palmer in in case he has anything further that he would like to add and then open up for questions. Thanks. Yeah, that's all my, my hands up. So I think much like the approach we've used with all of the Pathway Zero work, you have seen. So the success is there in really giving ownership back to the pathway coordinators on the wards, back owned by the wards. We've given them the data, we've given the length of stay, we've given them the IV antibiotics data, they're able to own it and start moving forward. And that's where a lot of the success. So the same thing we need to do with theatres. It's about giving the band sevens for each theatre the ownership of that theatre so they can make sure that post-scheduling, they're owning the order, the equipment, uh, the start of the running. And actually at NGH, we have a good, um, as far as the data tells me anyway, and walking around, we do usually start roughly on time. The issue here is a lot of the, inter the uh, in between cases, the amount of time it takes to turn around. I think one of the other bit parts we're going to have to deal with is the late starts and early finishes, sorry, the late finishes and early finishes. Everyone would like to finish early, admittedly, but nationally when you go around it, the general rule is a third can finish late, two thirds finish early. Because you can never ever, otherwise people never ever kind of use the utilisation to 100 when booking. And as long as we keep to that, then the staff will always get their a better share of the deal and we'll get more patients through. So I think there's, there's a lot of work to do. And you'll heard this morning that actually they are still tired there is a but they are still really keen to try and improve because a good day for them is just a well-run theatre but it just is quite a large struggle for them we put a lot of barriers in their way and they put a lot of barriers in their way so there's a lot of work we can do but this data is really key for us or me as a senior leader to own theatres and a challenge but also for them to own their own theatres and how they move forward so i think it's a really powerful tool thank you thank you guys any comments or questions at all on that not seeing hands going up very quickly. I, that was a really good, where are you, Becky? There you are. Well, that was a really good presentation on how that works. Although I don't suppose there are many people on the screen who've actually booked theatres or organised theatre lists, even in the dim and distant past. But it was a really good presentation. I think the great trick in transformation is to think about a big issue, think about it in a macro way, and then solve it in a micro way because it's all the details. And when you solve it, you have to permanently solve it. You don't solve it with a little surge and you don't solve it by some clever little tricks. You permanently solve it. 
And that's the kind of approach we've got here. And that seems to be what we might expect. It will hinge, of course, on the training of people who can place people in the right list in the right order. It will, will hinge on empowering them um, to, to argue, if you like, about how best to use theater space with some of the other users. And in the end of the day, it will, to some extent, hinge on the surgeon's willingness to engage with this. Um, but I can't imagine our new medical director isn't determined to make that happen. So, anybody else at all on that? No? Thank you very much. That's a really good bit of work, guys. Keep it up. Um, and um, I think, again, it's the kind of thing we'd like to come back to. Uh, one of the things we're often criticised for is not coming back and looking at some of these um, business cases, return on investment or whatever. So I think I'd encourage you to take this back in, in a few months' time through quality governance, where there will be a few more people who know about theatre lists and booking present than there are today. Maybe sometime in um, the early New Year would be a good time to think about that. Thank you very much. Um, okay, where am I now? Turn the page now. Freedom to Speak Up annual report. We're welcoming Ellie Southgate, who should be here, and um, our new Freedom to Speak Up guardian, um, following some recent changes, I'm sure. Um, are you introducing this, Heidi, or are we going straight into Ellie? Um, so I can introduce it. Um, so delighted that Ellie's here, as you um, alluded to there, Chair. We have made a conscious decision when I came to make our Freedom Speak Up Guardian full-time and independent. Um, and so I'm delighted that Ellie's done some fantastic work, really good partnership work, which I'll hand straight over to Ellie um, to share more detail. Um, but we're certainly in a stronger position. Um, I would note that I am encouraging people to speak up, trying in the in the drive to improve the culture at NGH. Um, so, um, you know, this is something we should see as a positive, that people are starting to communicate and speak up on the journey to speaking up being part of the day-to-day -day activity. Thank you, Heidi. Um, for those I've not met yet, uh, my name is Ellie Southey, and uh, as has been said, I'm the uh, relatively new Freedom to Speak Up guardian. I've been enrolled since February, so I've taken responsibility for the Freedom to Speak Up programme halfway through the final quarter of the 2021-22 reporting year. I am currently on a secondment from my uh, employer, Care Quality Commission, and this is my second secondment to Northampton General, having completed a clinical secondment at the start of the pandemic, uh, as I am a physiotherapist by background. I'm delighted to join you today to speak about the status of the Freedom Speak Up programme at Northampton General over the past year, and as it was as I joined the Trust. So thank you for the slide, Richard. Um, all of the data that I'll speak to today was uh, in the annual report that I submitted, so nothing particularly new, but I wanted to talk you through some of the data. As you're aware, um, Northampton General is a medium-sized trust, just exceeding the threshold for entry into this category, which is of five to 10,000 employees. As a result, the average expected cases per year for a medium-sized trust of 104 is far above what we have seen for 2021-22 at just 47 cases. As you can see, there was a slight raise reported in quarter four uh, of 16 cases. Um, and this will be explained by a number of reasons. Um, as a result of that um, increased partnership working that Heidi alluded to there, um, engaging with staff through Connect, Explore, Improve initiatives that aims to bring about continuous dialogue to understand how culture and service delivery can better serve our people and our patients. My arrival at um, Northampton General with the uh, increased promotion of the Freedom Speak Up program and its increased visibility. Um, my partnership working and regular engagement with HR, OD, EDI, staff networks and other representation groups and agents to escalate concerns, concerns share insight and support improvement activities. And indeed, the arrival of an independent Freedom Speak Up garden, guardian may well have encouraged colleagues to come forwards. Next slide. Thank you. On this next slide, we'll have, uh, we can see detail about who is speaking up. And please note that the staff groups here are reported in line with the National Guardian's Office reporting categories as is required by my role. Part of the work I've taken on since being in post is better understand the barriers our colleagues face to speaking up. All NHS organizations were encouraged to develop their Freedom Speak Up programs in line with the needs of their population. And limited guidance was offered on how to identify, record, and address barriers to speaking up. 
NHS staff survey results for 2021 indicate that if we are to make impactful and sustainable improvements to our working environments and services, we must focus on these barriers that our staff perceive as obstructing them for raising their concerns. As you will be aware from the NHS staff survey results, on average, just 41% of our colleagues believe that they would something would be done in response to their raising a concern. So one of the ways in which I've been addressing this is for the first time for NGH, developing a picture of from where speaking up cases are coming, and more importantly, perhaps where they are not, so that we have a better understanding of where barriers exist for colleagues. I've been cross-referencing this with the staff survey results for hospital areas to triangulate the insight, and I'm developing an offer with HR and OD that aims to, to guide discussions on barriers, raising concerns, and improving the speaking up culture within our teams that the data indicates are struggling with this the most. I've also enhanced reporting categories, asking colleagues who are raising a concern to self-report their ethnic background, protected characteristics, staff representation, network memberships, and band or, and job title. In the future, I will provide this detail in reporting to give a better understanding of the issues within large staff groupings and not report solely in line with these categories. For example, separating out nurses from, from midwives who have very different and distinct concerns. I'll continue to offer the consolidated data as is seen here, um, as these correspond with other reporting categories, which will allow for analysis, for example, with the workforce rate equality standard data. Thank you, slide. And on this next slide, we should have data for the types of concerns reported. It should be noted that as a result of my coming into post in February 2022, the assignment of categories is um, categories to case is subject to change from this point on as a result of individual bias. It should also be noted that the National Guardian's Office guidance on reporting cases and reporting data states that a case may include elements of a number of different categories and you should select all categories that apply for the case. This guidance document was issued as I arrived into post and hence there is increased reporting in categories across Q4. Finally, I'm working with Valley's ambassadors. This is the network of volunteers spread across the hospital who offer alternative places for staff to get support and advice on concerns they might have. To co-produce a local level understanding of the new category, again, introduced by the National Guardian's office most recently, which will record any case that includes an element of other inappropriate attitudes or behaviours that do, do not con constitute strictly bullying or harassment. I hope this has provided a helpful overview to the details submitted in the annual report and happy to take any questions you might have now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if you want to discuss any of the particular areas or anything in any detail that might identify or get near to identifying people, we do have an opportunity to do that in the part two of the meeting. So please just think about that uh, as you ask your questions. David. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Ellie, for that uh, for that overview, uh, and and especially the overview of what um, uh, what 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 you're doing to improve the situation we have, because evidently, based on the benchmarking data you have, we're we're below where we should be. Uh, I, I just wondered, are you beginning to get some traction with the improvements you're putting in place? You know, I especially note the value ambassadors you have there. Um, that 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 you know that 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 is a that that must improve the situation significantly from your point of view. Yes, and thank you for that question and for raising the point about values ambassadors. I've actually only spoken to a very small number of actions that I've taken since I've been in in February, but the values ambassadors network is a really key um, element of the of the program to to really drive the um, the culture and the 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 learning culture and improvement culture to every area of the hospital. Um, and just in the last um, couple of weeks, we've launched more training for and recruited more values ambassadors. Um, next month at our Valleys Ambassadors Forum meeting, we'll be discussing further the barriers that are very individual to Northampton General um, and talking about how we overcome them um, with sustainable, impactful solutions to co-produce those um, activities that will improve speaking up and improve cultures. Um, and equally, as you say, um, we'll be working together as a group to identify ways of recruiting more people to that cohort 
so that the reach can be expanded. But very much so coordinating all of that information in partnership with all the initiatives that we've spoken to already that, that Heidi touched on um, that, that have been um, building momentum prior to my arrival, the fantastic work of the EDI team, um, HR support and organized, organizational development interventions, and indeed the recently um, launched Connect, Explore, Improve initiative. So there's a, the, it's, a Freedom Speak Up is um, working within those partners, within that group to triangulate data. Thank you. Uh, Heidi. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the, the depth of information that Ellie has gone into in terms of her analysis in the staff survey, even areas where um, it would seem on the face of it that actually it was a positive outlier within NGH. She's really dug down into the detail aligned to understand where there might be barriers, etc. So she's um, done an immense amount of work. There is, I have to acknowledge the strong partnering with EDI um, and with Tracy particularly and HR more broadly, um, which gives me confidence that we are moving in the right direction for Freedom Speak Up and the ambassadors to have the impact that they need to whilst we're on the cultural journey. And as part of Connect, Explore, Improve, we are tying Ellie and the ambassadors in to make sure that, that it's really meaningful and, um, and people understand the value that Freedom Speak Up brings. And finally, just to know Ellie um, and her independence, she um, truly holds us to account, which is her role. Um, and I meet with Ellie weekly. Um, so just Tracy. Thank you very much. Elena. Um, thank you, Alan. And uh, hi, Elena. Nice to, to meet you. I'm an executive director here. Um, I, I know that uh, 47 uh, speak up uh, referrals is probably not something which, uh, which we should have, but still, it's 47 important informations which we collected. Uh, I don't know if it's a question to you or maybe to uh, executive colleagues, out of these 47 referrals, what one or two tangible improvements have we done? I'd love to speak to that. Um, I've actually submitted this within the report. Um, it's, uh, it's at the bottom of my report that I submitted, but um, I'm, I, I, I mean, I could spend the next 20 minutes speaking around some of this. Um, uh, the detail is all there, but um, it, I've, I've been delighted to work very closely with HR colleagues. Um, for example, most recently, we've had a safeguarding concern and it's really strengthened our partnership working in the management of that concern. Um, and, and we've not only um, strengthened our channels of communication internally, but certainly with external safeguarding agents. Um, and um, we all refreshed our understanding of the risk assessments and policies involved in safeguarding. I've worked very closely with HR um, on their policies and their procedures related to grievance, patient confidentiality, um, uh, staff exclusion, um, the application of um, certain uh, recruitment policy and preceptorship policy within midwifery and nursing. So that, as you indicated, that that learning that comes out of these cases, these these forty seven cases, um, doesn't just get locked away in paperwork or records. It is it is um, operationalized and shared trust wide. And actually, the next step I'll be doing um, is working with those initiatives that I mentioned previously, working with HR and OD and Connect Explore Improve to make sure that we get that information out to the to the broadest parts of the hospital. Indeed, I'm joining divisional governance um, meetings um, over the next months to make sure that that operation, that information is truly being operationalized. OK, um, any more? No? Nope. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a good report, Ellie. Thank you. We're glad to have you on board. It does look as if things that, that has... Uh, there will be some issues, I think, that might arise in the private meeting from that private part of the board, which will be helpful. Thank you very much for your efforts in producing the annual report. Oh, excellent report. Right. Um, annual report on the Southamptonshire Healthcare Charity. I, I see Keith Brooks has joined us. This is not something we've done before, particularly certainly not in my time, but... Uh, Keith has asked to present this report and, and bring us up to date with the work of a charity, which I think Jill is our representative on, and I think there's possibly some changes to that coming about who actually is the trustee. Keith, over to you. 
You're muted. You are muted. You remain muted. The button is bottom left. Yep, I've done it. Okay, Hopefully, I can also share the screen. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. Um, it, it is nice to come. I, 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 I sense it's probably four years since I last presented, Alan. To be quite honest, I think COVID got in the way and we've we've excluded it. So I, I did feel it was right to just come and quickly give you a a, a, for, a taste of what we're saying in the annual report for the charity this year. Um, I, I, I want to just start by just reflecting on some of the very specifics. I think firstly to remember, recall that we did formally merge the Kettering charity into Northamptonshire Health Charity from the beginning of the financial year. So we've had 12 plus months now of running with KGH and it's been, um, it's been challenging, interesting, and um, yes, it, it's moved us forward. And I'm, I trust we're making positive progress there. I think just to say in terms of grant making, I would sense our grant making priorities for the year have been around supporting staff, and patient facilities continuing on the themes of um, responding to COVID requests that had occurred in the previous year. One thing that I think is important from a charity perspective to reflect is that as a charity, we probably were one of the first to launch what is known as an NHSCT stage two project where we were seeking to serve the, the, the community of Northamptonshire and the Stronger Together programme, which ran throughout the year, um, ha has been a success, uh, which I think is really important. And I would like to, to reflect an appreciation to the NHF team, NHFT team that delivered that, that project. In terms of a noticeable negative, which I have shared with the trustees, is the fact that clearly the impact of limited visiting and limited patient and um, family access into the hospital has definitely had an impact on our donation streams that come directly into, into the 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 cashier's office in onto the ward. So that is a noticeable feature and a feature that it is a reality of what has happened. In terms of the financials for the year, which um, I particularly want to just talk about NGH now, uh, we've had some good donations over the year. We have benefited from the grant funding for the stage three projects which is primarily related to providing improved facilities for staff. We had a, 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 low, a low level of legacy income primarily related to um, cardiology. Uh, we restarted fundraising. So we did see some quite slightly more positive fundraising activities and the, the investment income that goes directly against NGH is the contributions for the lease of Springfield. In terms of our, our spend in the year, primarily our spend, as, as highlighted, has come from um, the activities that uh, we would describe as things like new, the new swallow room. I'll talk about that in a moment. Some of the, the refurbishment of places like the estates changing facilities and continuing a number of the other major staff support initiatives. There were a couple of pieces of medical equipment purchased. So in terms of spend, we, we didn't probably spend as, as much as we spent in previous years. The, the large chunk of money that's sitting in the grants paid in the core activity was funding Stronger Together initiatives. So that gives you a little bit of a highlight of the year. The investment income I show, by the way, is the investment income before I talk about investment gains, which do actually also go towards funding the activities of the charity. 
a few of the specifics. Um, the Swan Room initiative, I think, has been a really important one. I was impressed and we're sharing photos of that within the annual report. Um, Swan Rooms refurbishing side rooms so that they've improved environment for end of life care. Um, the pictures I've seen, I've not been and visited one, um, but the pictures I've seen impressed me no end. So I'm, I'm really impressed with that one. And I get the feeling we're on a, a, a path of doing a number more of those. I was pleased with what we achieved with the on-call rooms. Um, that looked good. Um, as a specific, uh, I, I recall looking at the on-call rooms many years ago when I when I was still part of the finance team at NGH and the, the furniture looked tired them. So by the time it got to the point of us doing the refurbishment, I think that was really good. Um, I sense the Porter staff area has gone well. I'm not going to make any more comment than that. I'd, I'd ask Stuart and um, some of his, his other colleagues to comment on it. Um, that was not using association COVID funding. That was using funding that came from Barclay Card, um, a project that I, I think we should be proud of in, in what we've achieved. And I like the artwork in the children's emergency department. So I'm really pleased that we achieved that one. Um, all of those, just to say, will be there will be pictures in the annual report of um, that will be shared on our, our website. So some of the specifics um, that I'm sure one or two would say, well, there was some medical equipment, but I didn't decide medical equipment listing, which generally comes from spending legacies. So um, we, we have been uh, positive in supporting some medical equipment purchases during the year. I think I'd like to record specific appre appreciation and that specific appreciation is to those that have served the subcommittee. It is great and I, I particularly extended a thank you to David who whilst not acting as a trustee has been a really regular supporter of the, the, the um, subcommittee and thank you David for that that input from which is augmented that of the trustees I mean I, we've really appreciated that so I felt that the subcommittee has worked well and I sense we've made hopefully made all the right decisions I'm not I can't see a nod of disagreement or a, a non-agreement from David I can see a, a, a smile thank you David um, there are we have started to relaunch some of the fundraising events. We were successful last year with our golf, golf day. That was a, a positive. Um, we've been successful in some of the other smaller events we've run. Interestingly, we are now finding that some of the mass participation events that we've started this year, we are finding the challenges of levels of economic conditions being challenging, but at the same time, um, we're going forward in that. And as last year, I reflect on the fundraising we achieved through the, um, the, the Trinkling Stars Appeal and also th through the Tree of Light. And I'm pleased with what we've achieved there. And I would like to say thank you for all that you've done to help facilitate that. Now, one thing that we have achieved at the end of the year that we've now been appointed the charity of the year for the Northamptonshire Chamber of, Chamber of Commerce. And I felt as a way of just getting away from my voice, I would share with you a, a short video that we used for the appeal for those funds. And just it, it kind of reflects the work of the charity uh, relatively well. And hopefully the technology will work. Let's see whether it does. Hi, my name's Lorraine and I am one of the community fundraisers here at Northamptonshire Hills Charity and I'd like to share with you why you should consider us to be your next charity partner. With a population of over 700,000, Northamptonshire is served by our two hospitals in Kettering and Northampton, plus community hospitals and services located throughout the county. From the very beginning of a new life to end of life, our NHS touches us all at some time in our lives. Around the clock, ready to treat and care for us, and as the charity that supports them, we're proud to fundraise and be there to help. With 
also many different wards and projects to choose from, as well as our headline appeals. There really is something for everyone, an opportunity for the Chamber and its members to support and fundraise for what really matters to you. From cardiac to cancer, A&E to intensive care, dementia to diabetes, to maternity, mental health and so much more across our NHS. And what about our unsung heroes, the cogs of our NHS that keep us going? From pharmacy to porters, our domestic and estate teams, our amazing volunteers across both hospitals, we fundraise for them all. We have a shared goal of being there to support our community and by partnering together we can do this. We can make good things happen and of course have some fun along the way. As we begin to open our doors once again, we will work with you to identify opportunities to spend time with us, to share your skills and volunteer at one of a number of projects we have planned. This is your chance to get involved, from getting stuck into a garden makeover that we're currently fundraising for, to supporting us at future fundraising and profile raising events. Whether it's an adrenaline filled skydive to running a marathon or joining us on our golf day, we have challenges and events planned and you are all invited. Have your own idea? We're excited at being shortlisted for Charity Partner and we want to make sure we get the best out of our partnership with you, which is why we will work with you on your own ideas too. By choosing Northamptonshire Health Charity, you'll be supporting our NHS across the county. Thank you. And we were successful, which was really rather positive. But it does give us the, the challenge that we need to have the right list of cases for need when, when each of those um, local organisations say, what can we do for our charity day? We do need a case for need. Specific items for units, wards, departments. Um, we'd, we've generally got a relatively good list but that doesn't mean we don't want more. So there's always the challenge to you, think about the cases for need and identify them so that we can say, yes, you could fundraise for this or you could fundraise for that. Now the, the frustrating bit is very frequently, we get asked just to spend money at subcommittee. Um, we don't very often get asked for, would you think about fundraising for this? So sometimes it is a need. Now. I'm sure Alison and the team very often talk to staff across the trust and pick up those ideas, but it is quite important to, to have that in, in all, everybody's mind, sometimes think and prompt. And I leave that with Heidi as a particular challenge because that list to me, Heidi, is really helpful occasionally. If you see something, you think that would be just the right thing to do. And obviously, and there's a number where you can, you can continue. So that's the, always the big ask from me. There's also another ask, which is that you keep changing staff. They keep moving around and we do need to get those fund ambassadors, fund advisors up to date. So there is, a, there is that continued challenge and I, I continue to seek support and help in terms of ensuring that we've got the right fund advisors acting as champions across the trust. So that is really important. And then a couple of, of other specific asks, please encourage staff to get involved with, with opportunities. We, we ran Spring Into Fitness this year. We are planning to do it next year. It, it's a good opportunity to encourage staff to both fundraise and to, and to have a, a new challenge. And if you've got a member of staff that's particularly getting involved, do support them. I, I'm at least very conscious there is at least one member that, that has appeared in my video this morning. Um, and, and do support them when they're doing a half marathon, for instance. It is really important. Please encourage them and do share that encouragement. 
And finally, the important other question is, please share with us the specifics. We have talked at subcommittee level about particularly understanding the needs as we move forward on some of the group developments, particularly with some of our, our larger medical ward funds, we need to understand which is the correct way of moving in terms of some of the group conversations. Now, I have shared that conversation with Simon, uh, and I have to some extent shared it with Heidi as well. But it, it is important that we keep thinking about that because we cannot, we can only do what we can do if you keep us informed. So hopefully that's left you with a, hopefully a, a feeling of relative positivity about that the charity has been working for you and supporting you in the past year. And I'll hand over to you for any questions you wish to ask me. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, I welcome comments and questions. That was a good, good review. Thank you very much for that. And I have um, four hands up actually. Heidi, could you take, could you take the presentation down, please? Well, yes, I'm I'm sorry, I was, I will who I'm talking to. That, I Heidi and then Jill, and then I'll see who else is up there. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I just wanted to really highlight, obviously thank Keith and colleagues, but highlight that some of these, whilst we a lot of it's refurbishment of areas and things, some of these have a really direct correlation, which is why Hammett may have his hand up, with us being actually leaders in some care delivery, for example, the Gynac robot that was donated. Um, we, Hema may want to come in on that, but it's, it's just how we communicate that. Um, what I would say in summary is challenge accepted, Keith. Um, you've given me a number there in terms of giving you a list. Um, working probably a bit more closely with you by the sounds of it. So um, let's pick that up. Very happy to accept all of the challenges you just threw my way. Okay, thank you, Jill. Um, so just to echo Heidi's thanks in, in terms of um, Keith and his committee uh, and, and his team uh, and the work that they achieve. And I think he's um, particularly undersold uh, the charity's activity for NGH in Northamptonshire. And two particular things I want to mention is the support to the, um, the conference that we had for nurses and midwives at NGH. And also thank you, Fest, across the system. Um, post COVID, which I think has been uh, took a lot of work and a lot of refining, but has gone down particularly well with staff and uh, uh, all the other staff initiatives. So we've been talking about staff fatigue post COVID, and the charity have played a big part in helping to resolve that. So thank you, Hermant, and then Helen, please. Thanks, Chair. I, I, I want to extend uh, my thanks uh, on what Heidi has said, particularly on three areas. One is uh, uh, the immunofluorescence uh, machine, uh, which uh, gives us capability for a sentinel node, node biopsy in gynec cancers. And, and a huge thank you for support uh, in instrumentation that specialist still table in the air seal, which has made uh, uh, the robotic assisted surgery uh, implementation and operationalizing it easier. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the last point with Kit, we have a huge uh, wish list and we'll definitely ping it up to you very soon. Thank you. Ellen. Thank you, Keith, and a big thank you from Nursing and Wifery, as Jill's already said, supporting our conference, but also our pathway journey. Um, just a little note about the Swan Room. You saw me lounging there on um, one of the bits of kit of the Swan Room. That family was so impressed that they actually funded the next Swan Room. It made has made so much difference to our patients, so thank you. Um, just uh, again, just a note, I've been meeting with Alison, and the first job that she's given me is, in fact, cleansing um, the fund advisor. So I do have that job to do, but just a massive thank you to you and your team. Thank you, Stuart. I'm going to echo Jill's point about underselling the support. Um, with the estate's capital always being limited, and we, we have to focus that on replacement of safety equipment. Um, the way it wasn't really the porters' restroom; it was the male and female changing areas for domestic staff porters. That was a massive refurb and made such a difference to that staff group. Uh, and Keith, you forgot to mention the new garden you put in and the fact that you funded all the furniture for the new restaurant as well. Yes. Again, is, is money we can't afford from the capital budget. So thank you. The furniture's this year. So that, that's why the, the furniture wasn't mended. And I, I've, I've avoided gardens because I've done gardens with NHFT earlier. Sorry. 
Oh, we've got a fantastic new staff garden now. It's something we can be really proud of, and, and you guys oh. have helped fund that. Okay. And there's some more coming as well, I think, uh, Ms. Stewart. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Keith. That's a good report. Um, we very much appreciate, as everybody has said, all the work that you do. And um, uh, your ask is noted. I'm sure we'll be better partners this year than we have been last year as uh, Helen takes forward the cleansing of our list and Heidi connects with you about having a really updated list of things to raise money for. Look forward to your successful partnership with the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that was a good report. Um, group Board Assurance Framework, PATH. Um, Richard. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this was, <coughs> excuse me, alluded to in several of the committee updates earlier. So um, hopefully um, all board members are aware of the work that's gone on. So the report before you today brings together the culmination of the work that's been done with lead executives and committees to consolidate the three board assurance frameworks for, for this trust and for Kettering and the group BAF into a single group board assurance framework, which um, sets out the eight risks linked to the dedicated to excellence strategy. So um, again, as, as I say, the um, all of the committees have indicated their support. The audit committee has also endorsed the, the new framework, the new template, as have the committees. So today you are asked to formally uh, approve the wording of the eight new group risks. And in doing that formally, close the former um, NGH BAF and also to note specifically that um, risk NGH 113 we're asking you to formally um, move that to be um, less relating to the uh, pandemic response uh, move that to be managed um, operationally is within the corporate risk register um, <clears throat> subject to your approval we will be um, putting back in a deep dive programme for the committees to review these risks on a rolling basis and that'll be the opportunity there to to drill down into um, to provide assurance and challenge around the controls around the assurances and around the scoring and also around the appetite um, so uh, the new group BAF for your approval thank you thank you Richard it's a good piece of work it's been through all the committees I kind of hope and sort of assume that that's everything's okay with us Everybody all right? Good, excellent. You consider all your requests met, Richard, and they've endorsed all the things you asked for there. Thank you. Um, trust report to Auckenden. Uh, Helen, I think you're doing this. Thank you, Chair. So um, the paper that's been submitted by Adebi um, is a snapshot um, against the performance or the performance of the maternity services at Northampton against the immediate and essential actions um, that came from the Ockerden report. Um, I'm aware that Debbie presented much about the Ockerden report at the last board meeting. So in summary, there are around 109 actions, um, a number of which we are waiting um, national clarification um, and handlers. Um, but of the remaining ones that we do have, they are detailed in appendix one, we have 65 actions that are green, 22 that are amber, and two that are red. The two red actions are against um, a bereavement care service, um, which is required to be seven days a week. And currently we provide one at five days a week. And then the other one is around birth of babies of less than 27 weeks gestation. Um, and um, this is partly a network performance as well as an NGH um, performance as well. So the benchmarking assessment tool um, will be updated as more, more responses um, are received. For additional assurance, um, there is planned in um, August to be a deep dive into the, um, the immediate and essential actions, uh, just to provide that additional um, eyesight and oversight on them so that we are absolutely tight and sure of where we're going to be doing. And uh, we'll be able to add that to our action plan. Um, the other part of this paper is around our midwifery continuity of care position. So that formed, again, a little bit of the Ockerden report where we were asked to review um, where we were. We took the decision um, that our one team we would keep in place. 
um, the risks of removing that team um, within a, a vulnerable group of our um, population outweighed the benefits of removing of, of bringing those midwives back into service. Um, and again, the risk assessment is um, detailed in Appendix 2. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, comments, questions, obviously, but I'd remind you that we have an opportunity to talk about this in a little bit more detail, a little bit more precision in the private meeting. And we, uh, as Helen says, are looking for a session uh, next month, uh, middle of next month-ish, in order to really look at this when some of the key players like Debbie Shanahan and others are back. And, and partly to stop it becoming the dominant thing in the quality safety quality governance committee because there are other things to talk about there jill um thank you chair and thank you helen <clears throat> just to add that um that there are two things happening uh, in august one, one is the uh, is a seminar on maternity safety which of course is connected to ockenden but the other is a, is a is a challenge session on the ockenden report so at the moment um the action owners have decided uh, the status of the RAG rating of Ockenden. So we feel it's important that we do have constructive challenge of these in a round table exercise. So the board may or may not see some of these areas uh, moving around, but actually overall it, it's, it's pretty good in terms of the numbers of green areas, um, which is again why we particularly need to challenge uh, and make sure they are green before we um, put together the comprehensive action plan. Thank you. Heidi. Thanks, Chair. Um, so as you've noted, we're covering more detail in private board and we have got a thorough seminar coming up. Um, <clears throat> firstly, to thank Jill for her um, incredible work from an Ed's perspective in this area um, <clears throat> and to acknowledge that we, excuse me, are um, working with the region as well, given some of the challenges with Ockenden are still being discussed regionally and nationally in terms of what that means for each unit. Um, so whilst we're doing lots of work in, internally um, and there's lots more to do, um, we are continuing to make sure we're linking regionally and nationally on some of this um, in terms of what our vision and ambition is across Northamptonshire. Okay, thank you very much. Any other comments on any of that at all? It's, um... A good update at this point. We'll take a little bit more later and then we'll do some. There's more work going on in August. Um, rightly enough, a big ticket item and one of our areas of some difficulty around recruitment and uh, retention and so on. So thank you very much for that. Um, appointments to um, to confirm the appointment of Heidi as trustee to the Northampton Healthcare Charities. Good luck since you're clearly committed to that, and to as uh, of Elena to the group people committee and the group digital hospital committee, which I kind of hope she's agreed to before I put that up there. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. All happy with that. Good. Um, questions from the public. I've got one received from Mr. Charles Wilkins, who asked the following question. Well, this is a relevant bit anyway. Following the issue of a jobs protection agreement in 2021, why has the trust made a U-turn on redundancies in the ICT department as part of its restructure? And how can it justify potentially making committed members of its workforce redundant who have worked tirelessly during the COVID-19 pandemic and during the biggest cost of living crisis in 40 years? I know Mark has responded directly to Mr. Wilkins, but it's still proper to give a response here, Mark. Thank you, Jay. Yes, I have. So um, just to confirm, we have not and do not intend to make any compulsory redundancies in line with the agreement. And we do fully recognise the impact of COVID-19 um, and the financial crisis that we're following at the moment, uh, and some of which obviously was discussed with um, Joe, Debbie, Katie and Ruth uh, this morning. So we're continuing to work on supporting them as best as we possibly can, um, as we recognise the challenges that that faces. It's been discussed on the agenda today and we'll continue to take it forward in the People Committee. Thank you very much. Any comments on that at all? Nope. Okay, thank you. Any other business? Nope. Okay, well, despite you giving me an opportunity right at the start, Mr. Smith, to say wonderful things about you in collaboration with our missing group chief exec, I thought I'd do it at the end. Um, so you've been with us for, what, three years now in NGH? Um, rather longer for more things to blame you for in KGH. So there will be a presentation happening on behalf of everybody, really, but it'll happen at the KGH board tomorrow. I warn you in advance, you know, look smart, dress well, all that kind of thing. Um, but we'd just like to record our thanks to you for all the work you've done, particularly 
in the areas which you, you freely admit are your bag, really, which is staff well-being, EDI, all of that stuff where you've certainly raised our game and the level of support for staff during the COVID pandemic. A lot of that came from your leadership. So we want to wish you well in, um, in Sussex Integrated Care Board back to somewhere you really want to live anyway instead of away up north here and and that will be good um we uh, we congratulate paula paula kilpatrick who's kgh director of people who's been appointed as acting group chief of people officer but the principal purpose of today mark is to say thank you very much for your years here and your years across the group and in the system where you've been a leader for the people agenda across the system and perhaps more importantly to wish you well in the work in, 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 in the South Coast Integrated Care Board in Sussex. Many, many congratulations on that appointment. I really, really hope it goes well. And the baby goes well. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, lots of agreement with that. Um, can I ask you to pass a resolution to exclude the public and the press based on the uh, confidential nature of the matters to be discussed? Nods will suffice. Heidi, your hand is up. I'm so sorry, Chair. Yeah, I'm so sorry, Chair. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge um, Matt Metcalf obviously stepped down as new as you alluded to at the beginning, but I didn't thank him in the last board because it hadn't happened at that point. So it's really important that we note thanks to Matt for everything that he's done at NGH and we'll obviously continue to work with him. Okay, I'm sorry I have a phone ringing in the background. There's not much I can do about it. But thank you very much for passing the resolution, which I presume you did. The private board meeting starts at 1.30 on a different link and the next public board meeting is the 29th of September at 9.30. And I'm sure you have noticed that our board development session in August is cancelled due to too many apologies. So thank you very much. See you at 1.30. Thank you very much, everybody.